Well, every night, do we? Um, I will go ahead and um, get started. Is that okay with you, Renee? Yes, please take it away, Jay. All right, I will do. As my computer is loving. Oh, I will need you to stop your screen sharing so I can screen. I will do that right now, so you can. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Can everybody see that? Is that sharing successfully? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, well, first, I'll um, you know, Renee gave me a, gave me a lovely introduction there, and um, I am the, a stormwater uh, educator and stormwater. Um, person that reaches out about anything that has to do with stormwater in Northwest Arkansas. I work specifically with urban communities um, and I'm, I really do love my job. Um, and so I get to go and look at how our urban daily lives impact local waterways, um, which is something I never really thought about. Um, actually kind of grew up as a, a little bit of a country kid. So I, it wasn't something I thought about. <laughs> I always thought about agriculture and how farming affects water. Um, so moving to Northwest Arkansas and learning about how the impacts of agriculture or impacts that urban environment can have on water quality was um, really eye-opening for me. So I hope that um, you guys learn something as we proceed today. Um, first, I want to talk about what happens when it rains. So when rain falls from our sky and it lands on a natural gra uh, ground cover, about half of that water is going to soak into the ground. It, you know, if your soil type's really clay, like here in Northwest Arkansas, it, it, it has some variance, variations to that. But for the most part, about half of it soaks into the ground. Um, some goes back up into the air through evaporation, if you guys remember the, the water cycle song from like fourth grade biology. Um, and then about 10% runs across our surface. Um, and that's called stormwater runoff. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking about mostly in my first part of my presentation. Um, and then as we start to develop, our landscape starts to change. This is still a pretty natural ground cover. It's got a few houses, some streets, some roads. Uh, but when it rains in this area, about half of it's going to soak into the ground still. But as we start to develop, and we start creating what's called impervious surfaces or hardscapes. So these are places that are where water can't absorb into the ground. So think about roads, driveways, parking lots, rooftops, sidewalks. Those things can't soak up water. So it's not letting it go into the ground anymore. So we look at an area like this, there's a lot of green space, but let's look at the sidewalks, the driveways, the parking lots, the buildings. Half of that area turns into what's called that impervious surface. It can't soak up water anymore. This is Fayetteville. Um, at two o'clock, I believe the baseball game was started. I won't be able to follow it, but uh, I'll be following from a distance. So anyway, so this is, <laughs> we have the baseball stadium down here. This is, uh, uh, or right there, this is 60 um, MLK coming through Fayetteville's uh, football fields, University of Arkansas football field. So just to orient, so orient yourself a little bit. We have a lot of impervious surface here in, in Fayetteville. Um, I took this picture actually out of the airplane. It was the last time I flew before COVID hit. Um, I didn't realize how, <laughs> how that was going to impact me now. Every time I look at that picture, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to travel again. Um, but now when it rains and we have what's called a 75% build out, which is really our downtown area, parts of MLK, um, that means we have 75% of our ground coverage unable to soak in water anymore. And so we used to be 50% going into the ground is now 15%. Um, we still get a lot of evaporation, especially here in lovely Tree City, uh, Fayetteville. Um, but we do get a lot more runoff. So what used to be 10% is now 55%. So that's a lot of volume of water that's coming off of our city streets. Um, and it's coming off not only just, you know, the, if you think about when rain falls onto a grass, it kind of filters through and that grass slows it down. Um, but when it falls onto a hardscape like a, uh, on your rooftop and it rushes into your gutter system, it rushes out of your gutter, down your driveway, into a street, it's moving fast. And we, we create this system of pipes to get that water away. It's moving at a much faster velocity. Um, so that speed of that water is moving faster and it's channeling as it gets into our creeks and our streams. So we have a municipal separate storm sewer system, an MS4, municipal, municipal separate storm sewer system. So that means our set of pipes from our streets 
is different than the set of pipes that come from our houses. When you flush your toilet, do your laundry, do your dishes, that water goes into a wastewater treatment plant and it gets treated. Um, ours in Northwest Arkansas and throughout all of Arkansas, we have a, um, a separate set of pipes. So we want to get the water away from our homes and off of our streets as fast as possible to protect us from flooding. And so we have our water go straight to our creeks and our streams. And you think, oh, well, why don't we have ours combined like other, other places do? Well, some of our older communities, such as uh, think of New York City, uh, Chicago, older parts of St. Louis, um, those do have combined sewer systems. And the issue is that, especially here in Northwest Arkansas, we get about 45 inches of rainfall a year. Think about these five inch rains that we've been having. When that falls and flows through our um, and flows through our, our uh, storm drain system, if that went into a wastewater treatment plant, it would likely back up the, the sewage that's there and bring that back to our streets and we'd have a health and human safety issue. So if you're ever, you know, walking around, um, you know, downtown New York, and it's a really bad uh, flood issue and you smell something, it could be their sewage is backing up. Um, and so they realize that's not the best way to do it. So let's channel it straight from our streets to our creeks. Let's get the water away for health and human safety purposes. But now what is the impact on water quality? So what's coming off of our streets? So we have a lot of things that could be on our streets or over those, those impervious surfaces that we talked about that's washing away with our stormwater, that 55% volume of water that now flowing across our surface. Think about things like sediment that comes from construction sites or bare soils, um, just any type of erosion that might be happening. Um, nutrients, things like overused fertilizers or pet waste. Um, we did some calculations recently and the city of Fayetteville produces about 6 million pounds of dog waste a year. So if that's not disposed of properly, um, those nutrients um, could be getting into our waterways. There's also nutrients from erosion. Our soils have nutrients in them. That's what makes our plants grow. Um, you know, we can deplete those and we, that's why we need to add more fertilizers, but um, there are legacy nutrients inside of our soils. We're a very phosphorus rich um, area in Northwest Arkansas. So a lot of our soils already are rich in phosphorus. So as that soil goes into water, that phosphorus gets released in the water and creates more algae growth. Um, litter, so things like floatables, um, whether it's intentional or unintentional. A lot of times you put something in the back of your pickup truck, you think it's gonna stay there, you get on 75 on the highway and it's gone. Um, bacteria, uh, so things like in that pet waste, so bacteria is going to come from some, some kind of fecal coliform, um, so that's in our waterways. Pesticides, so uh, again, usually it's a misuse of label uh, for pesticides um, or overuse, spraying driveways, things like that. Um, and automobile fluids. In Washington County, we have 258,000 registered vehicles, so just a fraction of those had um, an oil leak or some kind of um, some kind of leaky auto, auto fluid. It's thousands of cars. Have you ever been to a parking lot and see that rainbow sheen in a parking lot? It's pretty, it's a rainbow, but it's also pollution, it's oil. So that's not very good for our waterways when all that's hitting. And then not to mention that velocity that we talked about. So this is one of the things that we're really seeing a major impact on our creeks. As soon as, you, and it's happening inside the city. So you'll actually have some pictures here of Gully Park, but it's it's really, as it gets out of our city ways and hitting those rural areas, the water is moving so quickly that it's creating these cut banks. Um, and that's that, those vertical lines, you'll see trees start to come down and that, that bare erosion soil, and that's just dumping soil right into the waterways. Um, so this one, again, this was Gully Park. Um, and that cut bank, it's just every time it, we have a little, and, and those, upper headwaters, um, like the Neocosca, when it rains, it doesn't take much to make a raging water go through. That's a lot of, every time it rains, all that can end up right into our waterways. So this is what happens. So when that sediment's flowing, it becomes suspended in water and it's flowing with the stormwater runoff, it's going into a creek. As it starts to hit our water bodies, that sediment starts to settle which is great because the water clears up. Beaver Lake is actually one of the dirtiest lakes and one of the cleanest lakes in the state of Arkansas. At the 412 bridge, it's actually one of the dirtiest lakes in Arkansas as far as turbidity. You can't see through the water because it's got so much suspended sediment. By the time you get up to the dam, it's actually one of the cleanest lakes. It's gorgeous, it's super clear. You can jump in the water and see well past your feet. Um, and the reason is because all that sediment it is starting to to sink to the bottom because it's heavier, the water is moving slower. So this gives it time for that sediment to sink, which is actually covering up our, um, 
the any of the microorganisms living on the bottom or our small benthics that live on the bottom of our, our waterways. Um, this is the source of food for our fish. It also makes it hard for fish to be able to see their food um, or to hide from predators. Um, and then also we talked about those legacy nutrients that are inside of that soil. Um, it creates algae growth um, and algae growth is um, it has a foul odor. It can make our drinking water taste funky. Um, it is unsightly recreation. If you're jumped in a body of water and you have like green slime or hairy algae with you, it's, it's not very, it's not very good. And it, it's naturally can be there, but when it grows at an unnatural rates, it can have a, a problem for our waterways. Um, and when it dies off, it actually sucks out the oxygen out of the water as it starts to decompose, which is also a problem for our, our fish and the habitat of the water. All right. So the more you know, this is my, this is, I told you about stormwater, that's my why. So what can we do about it? What's our options? So one of the things that I found that I believe in truly, so I do, I teach all sorts of different impacts of waterways. Um, but one of the things I really feel like it's gonna have the biggest impact on for urban homeowners, urban landowners on our water quality is to help slow down, spread out, and soak in that rainwater before it has a chance to leave our property. So I know there's a lot of homeowners out there that have issues with run, what we call run on. So your property line, probably maybe a development happened up uphill or something's going on and you are receiving a lot more water than what you had. That's going to take some pretty, pretty big engineering probably to fix. There might be some issues. Um, if you want my information at the end, we do site visits so we can come out and take a look at, at your um, property and see if there's something that that we can recommend or suggest or provide some resources for you. Um, but um, this is really to look at the mitigate the water that's coming from your property. So as that rain falls, you've created an impervious surface with your rooftop and your driveway and your sidewalk. How do we capture that water and make it stay in place so your downstream neighbors aren't being impacted? Um, I guess maybe I'm just naive or still optimistic enough to think that if we all work together, we can help have a large impact on stormwater downstream. Um, and so, if you guys believe with me and can feel me, um, let's do this together. Let's get stormwater staying on our site. So this is how I'm gonna give you a few little clues that may work for you. So one of the first things I'm gonna ask you to do is do an umbrella survey, go get wet. The next time, of course, I feel like I probably should have done this presentation a week ago because I'm looking outside and it's, I don't think we're gonna get rain again for a little bit where we've had so much, but um, go out the next time it rains and do an umbrella survey. Watch where is the water going, coming from, where is it going, how fast is it moving, how much water is there, and create a site map. This is a pretty fancy site map. You don't have to get this, this fancy, but um, you can it's just be hand drawn just to, to channel as you might be surprised where you think the water is coming from and going and to where it actually is. Um, so again, it can be hand drawn, but it, it's really interesting. Um, you can go online onto the most of the cities now have GIS. You can find your drainage. Um, so if you have storm drain infrastructure that you don't even, might even realize, or you might have a drainage easement you don't even know about in your yard that's made to channelize uh, stormwater, um, or all those things that are there, you, you can just take a little get to know your property when it's raining. Doesn't work after the rain stops. You have to watch the water flow. And then next you determine how much water you're, you're, you're creating. So there is a lot of fancy math out there and I am not a math person, but these are pretty basic. So we're gonna, we're gonna do this, I'm gonna call it Jane math because this is about as much as I can handle. So how much runoff is being generated from your home? So first you need to determine the footprint of your roof. Now this is a little confusing. It's the footprint of your roof, not the arch of your roof. <laughs> so when it rains, it really think about it as it's what is on the ground, like the shadow of it. Cause we don't really care about the slope. It's that percentage of water that's coming down. So it's length times width. So an example of this one is I'm gonna go measure the base of my house. Cause that's about the same as my rooftop. Um, and it was 25 feet, it's 40 feet wide. So that's a thousand square foot. So that's once you determine the, the square footage of your house, you're then gonna multiply it by 0.623 for a one inch rain. Again, we've been having a lot of heavier rainfalls, but a one inch rain is a kind of a typical rain. So in a one inch rain, um, which is what we do most of our calculations to, um, you'll figure out what your, how many gallons of water are generated on your impervious surfaces. So uh, again, this is, um, if, my was, if my square roof was 975 square feet, 
my square roof. If my roof was 975 square feet, it's about 607 gallons of water for every one inch rain. And as your houses get bigger, obviously by the time I get to a 3,000 square foot roof, um, it's going to get down uh, up to eight, 1,800 gallons of water. That is a lot of rain. Um, and that's a one inch rain. Again, we've been having three inch rains as a, almost the, the norm these days, which is really, um, and I don't think that's going to go away. So it's, it's kind of what we need to be looking at. So how do we, how do we capture that rainfall? How do we use it? Um, and then how can we keep our, downstairs, our downstream neighbors um, impacted from this water? Um, again, so assuming it, um, 45 inches is our average annual rainfall in Northwest Arkansas, which is we're pretty water rich. We get a lot of water. Um, and so that's 28,000 gallons of water every single year. That's a lot of water. Um, so here's some things we can do. I have put little uh, models, little, my little scales, I made these little scales. And so this is how much, this is how if they're less expensive to more expensive to build. If it's a do it yourself capacity versus a professional. Um, and I'm, as we go through each of these little techniques that we talk about, um, so look at those scales. And then the volume is kind of the, how much volume of water are we gonna be able to mitigate? So some of these techniques might be able to do a little bit and some might be able to do a lot. So how much water are we actually going to be able to get to stay on your property? Um, so your downspout, if you have a gutter and it's coming down, what happens when the water comes out of it? Is it going to your driveway? Is it going straight out to a street? Is it um, going into the lawn? Is it going into a flower bed? And think about different ways that you can maybe cut that gutter and redirect it. You can get flexi spout at any um, uh, hardware store. And this is a flexi spout right here. And just rechannel re it. Is it. And really, we want it to stop washing out any sediment coming with it. And we want it to slow down the water. So here's a little fancy rock waterfall you can have while at the storm water. But you see they have some gravel around it to help keep that um, uh, soil in place. Um, this person went through and made a little fancy U-turn and put it back out to their flower bed. This person simply just cut their drain and put it out to the lawn. All of those things are better. And these are, this one is a very inexpensive thing you can do to slow down some water. It's not a huge amount of collection that's gonna happen or surface, it depends on where you're channeling it to. Um, maybe you have a rain garden down, the, down from that, that gutter, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, but it's something you can do yourself. You don't need to have a professional come and cut your downspout. Um, any saw can cut that. And again, you can get the hardware for this at a hard, uh, um, hardware store. Rain chains. Now, this isn't really going to stop any of your water, but it's going to slow it down, um, which is better than nothing. And they're really fun and cute. Um, there are a couple of warnings I want to give with rain chains. Um, so this is a way just, again, you've taken away your whole gutter, your downspout at this point, and you've replaced it with these um, bowl-shaped kind of stopping mechanism. So as the water's falling down, it's having to go into this bowl and then back up and out, into a bowl, back up and out, into a bowl, back up and out. So it's slowing down at each little, little bowl cup shape that's going through until it gets to a bottom, some kind of dish or pit that's going to protect from soil erosion. So you don't want it falling and just hitting the soil and then washing away the soil. Um, it could go into a rain barrel or some kind of rain capturing to combine some of our practices that we're going to talk about. Uh, but uh, keep it, make sure that it is sloped away from your home. Um, so this right here, this bottom picture, I, you know, I get a little concerned. As long as that is uphill, that's fine. But you don't want to create a localized flooding problem here, which could happen with a rain chain. Um, so just make sure your house is pitched correctly, which means it's downsloped away from your home. You don't want that water to come back up. This one kind of bothers me a little bit because I feel like it's with that grass berm right there without having any type of channeling that if it was a heavy rain, it actually might back up a little bit and cause some local flooding. So just think about what's going to happen to the water once you put that in there. Diversion perms and swells. Uh, this is, I think, one of the easiest do-it-yourself projects that can be done um, with a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of research. Um, it's really inexpensive to do and could have a major impact on our runoff. 
I stole these slides from a, a company out of Massachusetts called Terra Firma. Um, Peter Jensen is the gentleman who runs that business. He actually was my permaculture trainer uh, for, I worked under him for several years um, and he was a county extension agent out of, I think it was Virginia or North Carolina. And um, he, he has <laughs> gone into a full career of stormwater mitigation. And this is his design that he has given me permission to promote. And it's, these are called keyhole swells. So what he's done is he's dug a big hole, especially here in, in Northwest Arkansas, we have clay soils. We want to amend the soil with compost and some sand to make it more permeable so that water can soak into that area. And then you create this little lovely trellis system. So you've, you've dug out a hole, you have amended the soil, and then you've kind of made a little path. You dug out a hole, amended the soil, made a little path, dug out the hole, amended the soil. He actually planted asparagus um, in his berms. I think Again, that's Massachusetts, it's a little colder. Their asparagus is probably a little bit um, more hardy, but um, I feel that uh, any of our native grasses like river oats, um, I'm gonna leave that one to Eric. Eric will talk about native plants here shortly and he'll have some suggest suggestions for some nice uh, uh, wet loving feet um, that can handle dry soil as well. Because again, it's only wet when it rains. You don't want any standing water around to create mosquito issues. So these are, again, they're amended soils. If you want to know more about this, my information is going to be at the end. So please feel free to reach out because, again, this is something I'm pretty passionate about. You see, I've given it a three water drop volume mitigation. That's pretty hefty. Um, so this is one of my, my favorite options for LID. Rain barrels. So um, rain barrels are great for 55 gallons of water. <laughs> and remember, we were talking about 28,000 gallons of water. Um, I think rain barrels are a great uh, educational tool to kind of introduce people into water conservation. Um, a one inch rain off of your roof is going to fill this up five folds. Um, and so it's not a lot of water, but it's great if you have, you know, to water your plants around your home. Um, we do them, this blue one is our style over here. Um, we get uh, food grade barrels donated from usually a uh, I think it's ConAgra now, it used to be Pinnacle Foods um, in South Fayetteville. We donate us a bunch of food grade barrels. We cut the hole in the top, put a hole, a spigot at the bottom, um, get a bulkhead tank fitting. Uh, we have uh, design plans on our website. And you can look at those and um, build a barrel for $15. Um, if you can't get the barrel donated, it's usually 20 bucks for the barrel. Um, Hog Eye Palette is a place that, that typically sells barrels. Um, or you can go to Sam's Club and buy one. They usually have them during the summertime, um, or you can order online uh, a rain barrel. Very easy to install, uh, fairly cheap when it comes to the LID practices. But it, it, again, the, your volume of water that you're keeping off is not a whole lot. You're not going to take away the entire volume of your water uh, from your rooftop. We do ask people to put an overflow. Use that little hose they have lined up there. Um, is that when it rains, that hose there probably, when it rains is to give the place, when it overflows, we put a, um, a water hose at the top to give it a way to kind of like your downspout, you can redirect the overflow. So I love rain barrels, but they're not, they're not the best. They can't mitigate an entire neighborhood worth of stormwater. Cisterns now, this is, this is like, this is rain barrels on steroids. They can do some mitigation for you. However, notice how we went from cheap to, to do it yourself to uh, we're now moving into that mid range. Um, and so cisterns can be anything from, you know, above ground, they can be below ground. You can have them connected to your gray water in Arkansas, which is great. You can um, flush your toilets with it. Um, you don't want to do like a kitchen sink with it or anything you're going to drink, um, but you can um, you reuse that rain storage. You can irrigate all your landscape with it. Um, you can uh, set up uh, fairly inexpensive pumps to these um, to power uh, drip irrigation systems. Uh, it's again, it's a lot of research. It's a lot of uh, internet. I would be intimidated to do this, which is why I would say you might want to reach out to a professional to help you design that for your for your home. Um, and then also is if you go below ground, I mean, that's a big tank. <laughs> so you're not digging that out with a shovel by yourself. You're going to need some equipment. And if you happen to have a backhoe and you happen to have some expertise, <laughs> that would be you know something you could do yourself. I would help. I would call somebody out for that. James. Right. Yes, ma'am. I was Renee. Um, Joyce is saying in the comment section that uh, they use 275 gallon barrels. So yes. That was making a, a, 
a big and catch. <laughs> those that's awesome and those are actually becoming have you seen they're like a white and they they're a white square barrel and they have kind of a metal frame on them um they are awesome and they're just now getting to where they're like more available and food grade and we and we keep saying food grade because we don't want to have some of these carry really nasty chemicals in them and you do not want to be watering your landscape with this stuff so that's why we stick with food grade barrels and they might still have like a high potency vinegar because we use a lot of vinegars and uh, cleaning products um, but those are fine as long as they've been rinsed before you use them um, but those are starting to become available and I think that's a really great it's a again it's that kind of boosted up uh um rain barrel but you can do it on a home scale size you don't have to bring any equipment it is heavy just make sure you put a solid base underneath it um, a gallon of water is eight pounds so uh if you're having 275 gallons of water again i don't do math i'll let you do that that's heavy that's what i'll say <laughs> so you need to make sure there's a base there to to be able to hold that 275 gallons but it's something you can do yourself that's a great point thanks um Okay, so rain gardens. This is where we're going to start getting into like kind of the, the meteor bulky stuff. Um, so again, you see that downspout, it's going out to a depressed bowl. Um, it needs the, the ground needs an amendment to be able to soak in that rain, because even if you dig a big hole um, in northwest Arkansas, you're just going to create a, a, a swamp. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> it's because it's our clay soils probably will not soak in that. So there's a lot of work here. I'm going to leave this over to Eric because he's going to touch into this in much greater detail about rain gardens um, and what plants are, are good for this. Um, but I would just point out we put this in kind of you can do a lot of this yourself, a lot of the digging you can do yourself, a lot of the plantings you can do yourself. I know a lot of people who have installed their own rain gardens. I would be a little a little hesitant um, skeptic for my skill level, but um, I think that a lot of people that have a lot more landscapes <laughs> and uh, gardening expertise than myself can do that. Um, and then it, it, it can be costly. So this is one of those, if you know, how much amendments are you going to need? Um, what kind of plants are you putting in there? Um, it, it changes uh, with cost, but it's it can be done fairly cheap. Dry wells and catch basin. So this is, uh, I, I put French drains in this category. Um, French drains, as long as you're not just shooting that water back out to the street and you really are letting some of that water stay on, um, on path. That's the one that's been used probably the most common and um, long-term use uh, for, for residential solving drainage issues on site. Um, it's not a bad option. Um, I've seen a lot of bad designs. That's not a bad option for doing it. So um, I definitely would recommend having uh, someone take a look at that that has a pretty wide knowledge of landscape um, education before doing that. Um, and then there's also this dry well. Um, so a dry well is kind of like you can do them yourself. You can get like a big trash can. You dig a hole. You fill it with like a pea gravel like you would a French drain that's uh, horizontal. But this is vertical. And then it has like you can go to again a home um, some kind of hardware store and you'll go down their drainage aisle and you'll see like little storm drain caps and if you have spots in your yard that's really bowling and, and holding a lot of water you dig a big hole fill it with gravel put this big plastic channel in there make sure there's holes all in it to give it that time that it space to drain out um, and then you have to make sure there's some kind of filter on it you see that this one's lined um, and you want that water to come because you don't want soil filling in. You don't want it to fill in back in with soil. You don't want to dig this out and maintenance it. Once it's in, you want to leave it in place. <laughs> um, uh, but leave the bottom open so it's not lined at the bottom and let that water slowly out. So when it rains, it's hitting this area. It's giving it a place to go when we're in heavy rainfalls. And then it gives it time to slow in, to sink into our, our soils. Our clay soils will take water. It just takes them longer. Um, so that's an option. And there's many different designs. There's huge commercial scale. They do this um, down to, again, residential size. Dry creek beds. Um, you know, the place I see this the most in Fayetteville is at Mount Sequoia. Take a drive through Mount Sequoia neighborhood, and you'll see these little rock uh, kind of terraces going around. And that's what that's what they've had to do. I mean, when you live on the side of Mount Sequoia, you get a lot of runoff. Um, and so these typically will have an under drain to them. Um, these aren't engineered. They're not. It's not just a digging a ditch and filling it with rocks. 
um, which is something you can do. It just will probably require a lot of maintenance. Um, so these are typically lined. They typically have an under drain. Um, you can have them landscaped and gorgeous. You can have them just bare, um, but it's, a, it's not supposed to hold water. It's supposed to drain water. Um, and give it a space for that water to sink in and slow out. Again, it needs, and I put two to four on this one because if done well, it can really sink in a lot of water or it cannot. Um, and kind of the same on the medium on these. You can do it yourself, but it's if you don't design it well, you're probably not going to solve all your problems. Green roofs, I am definitely going to back off this one and let Lee take over that because that is her gig. They are gorgeous and there's, you'll see, she'll explain all of this. Actually, this is Lee's green roof here. <laughs> so she'll explain all that. So I'm going to leave that to her. Um, uh, they are, they, they are definitely great for like that rooftop mitigation on, you know, so as long as that water is going off, it's not your driveway, it's not your sidewalk, but it's taking care of your rooftop. Um, I put this down as professional. Um, and they aren't cheap. Sorry, Lee. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> and she wishes they were, believe me. <laughs> um, all right. So, and then porous papers. I want to just touch on this a little bit. Um, I recently saw that you can buy porous papers at some of the large um, boxed uh, home improvement stores. And their, their bill on them is, is do it yourselves. But then when it gives you instructions on how to install them, they give you instructions on how to install them as if they were just a regular stone paver and you've lost your porous option there. So they don't talk about digging down, amending soils. If you're really wanting to do stormwater mitigation with permeable pavers, if that's really your goal is to get rid of a stormwater is you're gonna to need to put in some, um, you're gonna to need to amend the soils. You might even have to put in under drains. If you don't have anything to mitigate, if you're trying to mitigate all the water coming off of your house and off of your impervious surfaces, um, it takes a lot more engineering and design. And then those cracks in the pavers, they're gonna fill up with sediment. So what do you do? How are you gonna maintenance that down the road? There are large, for commercial scale, there's these huge vacuum trucks that they, they drive over the pavier, pavers and they suck them up and they clean them. Um, I like this design, which is a little bit grassed. And this is one of those like driveway designs. Um, but you know how impacted has that gotten? If there wasn't in all this extra stuff put underneath it, if it was just these little openings, it's probably just compacted soil. And you're probably not doing much stormwater mitigation. Um, but it's better than nothing. Look at this one. I mean, that one's probably not doing a whole lot of mitigation on its runoff, but just leaving that grassy strip there is giving it, and you're not driving on it. Hopefully you're driving straight in and out. If you don't drive in this area and kind of amended it, I bet you can actually get quite a bit of absorption into this little, even these little strips um, to the sides. So I just, those are just some options. I am not a huge fan of porous pavers for residential use, even though I'm seeing them more and more. Terrace landscapes. Um, this is when you start having some major, you're having erosion issues. And um, they, if you have a slope, one of the best things you can do to stop that erosion from happening is to create a wall. Um, and you can use native stones and just, I mean, I've got tons of these around my house where I've just picked up rocks out of our, our um, fields and, and put them around, but many people don't have the fields to pick up the rocks. Um, so you can purchase, purchase them locally. Um, you know, this one's actually, you can tell it's engineered, it's uh, fabricated that way, but it's a way to slow down that water to stop. Even when you design them, make sure that you give enough space to fill in with sediment. So if you're coming, this is coming down the hill, you know, when it first started, it probably, if it was here, it's going to fill in over time and you might have to maintenance those um, if it's not, if it's, if there's still continuous erosion happening. Um, they're great. You can put plants in them and a way to green up your space, um, but they're, they're a great way to slow down water. They can be expensive. If you don't have a bulldozer, they can be, you, you're going to need to bring somebody in to do that kind of stuff, um, if, unless it's a really small job. Um, I've seen some homes uh, recently where people are just doing them around their, uh, their curb and gutter system where it's sloped down and it's actually filling in and looking nice. They've been putting in these little, in these little berm gardens, um, which is looking, I think, great and a great way to slow down water on your property. Okay, so just a few considerations before you start installing LID. Again, in Northwest Arkansas, we'd be happy to come out and do some site visits to help you uh, get some resources or at least let you know if it's not a great idea or maybe not a right fit. Um, but it's your cost if you're looking for a return of investment on that. Um, with a lot of water mitigation, that's really gonna happen with cisterns. 
And that's the only way to really capture it and then reuse that water. Um, in Northwest Arkansas, our water is actually fairly inexpensive. So we don't get a whole lot of people installing um, LID features for the purpose of saving money um, for stormwater mitigation and rain capturing. There's air conditioning and cooling factors that in a larger in environmental cost, but, um, uh, and then why am I doing it? What problem will it solve? So if you're having a drainage issue, is it gonna solve that problem? So think about that. If you have water needs, are you gonna put in this giant cistern with this pump and all this irrigation system, but you don't have a landscape to irrigate it to? What's the point of having that cistern there? You don't have any place to put the water. You're gonna end up having to just pump it out anyway. Um, again, volume, so determine how much water you're using or how much water you're creating and then how much water you need. And then maintenance, uh, long-term maintenance plans are very important. Um, and so there is our website and that is my name um, and my phone number and my email. They are changing our email soon, but this will work for through October. So hopefully you can find me by then. So if you guys have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Good, thank you, Jane. There are a couple of questions in the okay. chat, so I'm gonna relay those over to you. And, and um, one is about the site visits. Do you do those throughout Northwest Arkansas or just in the city of Fayetteville? We do those in uh, most of Benton and, er Benton and Washington counties. Um, okay. If you live outside of those counties, um, you're welcome to contact me and I might know somebody that can come to your sites. Okay, thank you. And then um, there's also another question about what is the process for amending soil to encourage the mitigation? So compost is a great friend. So we think about anything that, so we have this clay soil in Northwest Arkansas. And so you wanna find out ways to break up that clay. Clays are, or particles are really dense and clustered together. So you need to figure out things that can get into that clay to, to separate those particles. So compost works, sand works. Um, um, you can even put in pea gravel sometimes. It depends on what you're doing to mitigate the soil. So if it gets into rain gardens, I think Eric's probably gonna talk, talk more about this. Um, uh, and if not, we can maybe touch on it at the end because um, it's probably gonna be kind of site specific as to how much amending you need as to how cl clay it is. And you can have a soil test done. We do nutrient soil test and we'll do a very basic soil typing for you for free through the extension office. So you can bring a, a soil sample in um, from your lawn. We'll, um, for free, we'll tell you what your fertilizer needs are so you're not over fertilizing. Um, and then they have a basic, but it, it doesn't go into detail. You'll have to pay um, a private lab to figure out like exact details if you really wanna get in some science of soil amending. But for the most part, some compost and some sand is gonna help you out tremendously. Okay, thank you. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, here we go, here's another Are question. Are there city ordinances that are against terracing for sloped yards? Um, there is some city, there's probably a lot of POA and HOA covenants before you do any, um, even rain barrels. There's some um, covenants out there that uh, do not allow rain barrels because of uh, mosquito issues um, or even unsightliness. I don't know. I would definitely six. So we, most cities are going to require a grading permit if you're going to be disturbing more than an acre of land. But if you're disturbing less than an acre of land, a lot of the times you will not need a permit from the city. I think if when in doubt, it's always best to give a call. Um, and if you're in Northwest Arkansas, give us, give me a call and I will Oh, hi, Diana, because I think you just recently came to a presentation I gave. <laughs> um, I would uh, I would be happy to to connect you with your your stormwater person for your city. Um, I'm not positive. Jane, about I can help one. answer that question. Oh, oh yeah, Lee, you store for Fayetteville. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so in Fayetteville, there's the Hillside Hilltop Overlay District, which is called the HHOD. That's I don't think other cities in Northwest Arkansas have that. No, only in Fayetteville. Um, yeah, and so that has to do with um, with water quality and trying to make sure water quality is consistent across Fayetteville, but also to preserve trees. Um, so you don't need to contact the city if you're just doing something in your yard or cutting down a tree, that's totally fine. But if you're building a new building, like Jane said, you do need to apply for a grading permit. Um, and it's a little bit different for the HHOD. So if, you're, if you live in a super steep part of town, you might be in that hillside hilltop overlay district and then there are some special rules but that's only if you're building a new building so right. don't feel like you can't go out and do a sloped terrace in your yard if you yeah I, I yeah i think that would be fine but they do and you can find if you're part of that um 
that Hilltop ordinates is from, again, that GIS, um, there's a layer on there that shows you that you're on there. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's another question about why is gravel better than just grass? Like, uh, it's, I don't understand the dry creek bed. Why is gravel better than just grass? Oh, that, okay, so I guess, sorry. That's, that's an excellent question. So this is actually thinking about back to that, that dry creek bed's going to, um, it's, it's not just gravel. You're not just digging a ditch and putting gravel again. You're amending the soil. You're changing the structure, that substructure of the soil to give it a place to go down. And the gravel, it's, it's kind of like a rain garden where it's a bowl shape to capture the water and give it time to soak, soak down. But this is kind of more of a linear rain garden where it gives it more time to go down. And a lot of time those dry creek beds are used more for that run on as, um, as you're capturing maybe a, a load area in your backyard where many residences are kind of coming into that area that gives that dry creek bed has more of a um, impact on those areas. Um, if your yard is grassed and you re, um, direct your downspout to go into a grass yard and it's soaking that water in, that's great. You probably were not built on red fill dirt. <laughs> but that's usually what happens is that they put houses on a lot of red fill dirt because that's what we have. Okay, thank you. And there's another question. Um, is there any benefit to one type of roof over another with regard to runoff water quality? Um, when it comes to water usage, it depends on what you're going to use that water for. So this is thinking about like rain capturing and reusing. So for rain barrels, um, there is a lot of debated science out there and um, even extension service has um, kind of gone back and forth on if um, you should be using that on any type of vegetated plant. Right now, we, we keep the recommendation of using it for landscape plants and not for edible plants unless you have a metal roof. Um, because of the the chemicals that are inside of shingles, um, and so even some of the, some of the terracotta roofs, I believe. But uh, metal roof is the best for the only one we can say that you can capture and then use that for edible landscape watering. Now, as far as um, runoff from a home going into our creeks and our streams. I haven't ever seen the research on that. That is an excellent question. And that's something now that I'm like, as soon as I'm done here, I'm gonna go Google that and see if I can find a study on the impacts of different types of roofing materials on stormwater. That's a great question. Okay. Someone recently asked me about tires and the wear down on tires. And I was like, I don't know that one either. And that's, I looked it up and there's actually quite a bit of research out there on what happens with all the tires as they get used and worn and torn. Well, thank you. Thank you for answering all our, our great questions. Um, okay. Very helpful, so thank you for that. Is there any other questions before we take a little break and and um, transfer things over to Eric's presentation? Don't see. Don't see anything popping okay. in here. That, well, thank again, you, Jane. I'm going to stop sharing, but that um, you, my email's there, my phone number's there. Again, I work at the Washington County Extension Office, um, so you guys can find me. Okay, thank you, Jane. Thanks, Thanks. Jane. All right. Um, like I said, I think that we are just going to take a quick break. So if you need to, you know, get a get a drink or um, Whatever you need to do, we'll just come on back. Let me see what time it is. It's about 2.52. How about we come back in five minutes and we'll, we'll, um, we'll let Eric take it away for us. I'm going to pause the recording and, um, and we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Welcome back, everyone. Eric Fuselet is going to be our next presenter. And Eric, are you ready to get started? I think so. Can you see my screen? Yes, looks great. Okay. We'll let you take it away. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm going to follow up from Jane's presentation and just talk about rain gardens uh, and specifically how we can uh, design rain gardens using native plants. So. Uh, just to kind of expand a little bit on her talk, well, first of all, just a brief definition of what a rain garden is. Uh, she went into this already a little bit, so you already have an idea, but 
Basically, a rain garden, these are shallow constructed depressions that have been planted with deep rooted perennial flowers. And, I'm, and I really want to encourage you to use native vegetation. You don't have to, but I'll go into it here in a little bit why, why you should really choose natives. Um, we strategically like to locate these rain gardens to capture and soak up rainwater that flows as runoff from the impervious surfaces Jane mentioned, such as roofs, streets, driveways, parking lots, or um, anywhere that you're going to have a lot of runoff coming from. So um, you can, you know, I'll go into a little bit on uh, a little more specifics on how to select, uh, you know, where to place a rain garden on your own property. Uh, but basically, after a, um, you know, heavy rainfall, these gardens will typically fill with a few inches of water. And if they're uh, designed well, or, you know, then they'll typically drain with, within at least 48 hours at most. You more normally much uh, sooner than that. Uh, what it does is this really does help to capture stormwater runoff and slow it down and to give it more time to soak into the ground. And then this helps recharge groundwater supplies and aquifers. Uh, and here in Northwest Arkansas, where we have, uh, we live a, a, on top of some karst geology, that groundwater is really important for resupplying, um, especially if you live in certain parts of Benton, Washington counties, but resupplying uh, the, the groundwater that goes into the caves that the um, endangered species like the Ozark cave fish uh, require in order to live or survive. So uh, the more runoff that we're having that's being, uh, that's not soaked into the ground, that's less groundwater that's getting down uh, into those underground habitats. Uh, and that could have negative impacts on those endangered species. So, uh, you know, detention ponds, uh, you know, rain gardens, things like that, anything we could do to encourage water to uh, infiltrate into the soil is gonna be better for that species. Uh, like I mentioned, this helps slow it down, store it before it enters into a nearby street or storm drain, because once it uh, does that, of course, this is going to be typically directed to, um, you know, our nearest creek or waterway. So what are the benefits of using rain gardens? Well, localized flood control. Uh, these help reduce the flow intensity of creeks during storm events. Uh, as we saw, those of us in Northwest Arkansas that were here in late April, we had that heavy rain. Uh, and because of a lot of our impervious surfaces, a lot of that water uh, was channeled to the nearest creek. Um, and then we saw those creek uh, you know, levels go up in these really strong, flashy flows. So the more that we're slowing down and storing this runoff uh, and encouraging it to soak in, then when we have those uh, heavy rain events or even just normal rain events, uh, the, the flashy, the flows of our uh, creeks tend to be less flashy. It tends to help um, reduce that. It also can help sustain creek flows during the dry periods. The more or the rainwater that we're allowing to reach the water table under the soil, uh, the more likely, the, the longer through the summer, through the drier periods, that creeks will be flowing. Because when you have creeks like perennial streams, intermittent streams, these usually have some of their water being fed to them from the water table at, uh, at the bottom of the creek. That's why intermittent streams tend to dry up during the um, dry months, such as the summertime, because that water table has gone down below the bed of the creek level. So um, that's usually why you're seeing that uh, creek dry up. So as long as we're contributing more to that water table and the groundwater, then, you know, that will help sustain those creeks and also any organisms that depend on those uh, aquatic habitats in those locations as well. Uh, this also helps improve stormwater quality by filtering the stormwater. The soil has an amazing ability to break down contaminants and filter stormwater, uh, which also is good just because it makes it cheaper to, when it comes time to treat that water to make it uh, drinkable for humans. So, uh, you know, the more we're, we're implementing these low impact development techniques in a watershed, uh, the better that drinking water is going to be uh, and the less of a, a tax burden it may be or um, less costly it may be. Uh, to the citizens uh, when it comes time uh, to, for the drinking water. Plus, it's just better for the aquatic organisms that are also uh, have a part in helping to break down any contaminants. Uh, this also, they also help increase water infiltration and like I mentioned, they recharge groundwater supplies and the benefits that come with that. Also, uh, rain gardens can be an effective means of mosquito control. Now, remember if, I, if they're designed well enough, and they aren't holding water for too long, and that water is able to drain out uh, within a few hours to, you know, 48 hours at most, uh, that is shorter than the breeding cycle of a mosquito. So even though mosquitoes may lay their eggs in that wa water, that rain garden, uh, those eggs may not hatch, or if they do hatch and become larvae, they're not going to become adults. So uh, they do have really quick cycles, go from eggs uh, to adults, uh, but typically if we can 
it can become a sink for mosquito populations in, in an area. So uh, that's one thing to consider if you're dealing with too many mosquitoes, uh, you might have too much standing water around and that might, this might be one way uh, to reduce the amount of mosquitoes on your property. Other benefits of rain gardens, especially if we're using native vegetation, is that this will provide some habitat for birds, butterflies, and beneficial insects. Um, a lot of our native vegetation has been evolving uh, with uh, the other elements of the ecosystem here, insects, birds, butterflies, moths, uh, whatnot. Uh, and so these uh, wildlife have come to depend on these native species of vegetation for their food and to complete their life cycles. Also using uh, rain gardens is a great way to enhance the beauty of a yard, neighborhood, or business uh, through a landscaped area as opposed to uh, something with a more impervious surface that may not be uh, used space. Well, this is a great way to uh, make it useful and uh, increase the aesthetics. So let's get a little bit into designing and planning your rain garden. First, you need to decide on location. Like say you have maybe a low area in your yard where every time it rains, water tends to kind of go to that area and just sit there. Uh, well, that's, well, that would be a great location for a rain garden. Uh, you know, you may have lawn grass that just can't grow there because it just stays wet too long. And so maybe you have like a little muddy or dirt patch when it's dry. Uh, well, putting a rain garden there is a way to enhance the aesthetics of that part of your yard. So think about that one also uh, near the discharge point of an impervious surface. Like Jane mentioned, uh, let's see where the water is coming off the roof of your house. Um, you can have the bottom of a, a drain spout. Uh, maybe there's a, a place along the road or a low spot on your street or your property. Uh, or runoff tends to go to, uh, these would be also uh, other locations, maybe next to your driveway, uh, something like that. Also make sure you're getting, staying 10 feet away from any foundations, trees, or underground utility lines. Uh, and always call 811 to, before you start digging anything. Don't wanna hit a, you know, electrical service line. Next step is to determine the texture of your soil. And what I'm meaning is the relative proportion of sand, silt, and clay particles. Uh, and the, the main one you want to test for here are going to be the clay particles. And you can do that through what's called the ribbon testing. And there's uh, two photos here that kind of demonstrates how that goes. You just take some soil and you get it somewhat moist. You don't want it too wet, uh, but moist enough to where when you uh, squeeze it in your hand, it can kind of hold together and form in a ball. And once you have that, you start to push it between, your, take your thumb, kind of push it over your index finger. And if it forms a ribbon, uh, the length of that ribbon can tell you about the clay content of that soil. So if it is a short ribbon, say less than an inch, uh, you should be fine. But if you're getting into a two inch long ribbon, you might have too much clay and that's gonna make it much more difficult for that water to infiltrate uh, once it's uh, stored in your rain garden. And just here's a diagram that kind of demonstrates that, how the soil texture affects permeability. If you look at like a sandy soil, which uh, they, you know, with a higher percentage of sand grains, less clay or silt, uh, you're gonna have larger pore space between these larger sand grains. So water's able to get down and filter through that and drain much more rapidly. Uh, you start adding more silt particles and a little bit of clay particles and getting more closer to like a loam. Uh, you know, it's going to have a little bit more moderate uh, drainage, so it's going to slow it down a little bit, but if you're looking at uh, a high clay content, you know, those particles are so small, the pore space between them is so small, and then there are also certain types of clays, depending on where you're located, that are called shrink swell clays, so when they get wet, they swell, and they get dry, they shrink again, and that really makes it difficult for uh, rainwater to infiltrate through them. So you can end up with a restrictive layer that's just going to cause water to pond uh, and not really drain so well. And it might even also contribute to more runoff. So uh, determine, you know, make sure you don't have too much clay. But if you do, there are ways to amend that. You can, that's the thing about soil texture is you can change it. That's one of the soil properties that's not so difficult to change. You can add sand to uh, the soil, put it out there, mix it in, and that will help uh, bring that soil texture from a less clay soil to a little more like a sandy loam or something like that. Uh, also compost, adding that to your soil is gonna be a great uh, way because uh, compost acts as kind of a glue or adhesive to soil and kind of help clump it up. Uh, and that will you know, help uh, create more force space for water to infiltrate through um, when after a rain. 
if you just for some reason cannot uh, fix your soil, uh, other uh, you know one way, you, another thing you could do is you can install an under drain. You know, have like a pipe that comes up, and the top of that pipe is going to be at the level that you don't want uh, the um, uh, the water to get above. So you got to kind of consider how deep uh, you can allow that water to get. Make sure the top of that pipe will capture any water as it starts to get above that. And then you'll have a perforated pipe that runs horizontally uh, that will help uh, filter out that water. You can even daylight the end of it or have it come out in an area where it's, uh, you know, will help release any excess water as it flows into the rain garden. Uh, you can even have that go into another rain garden at a little bit lower elevation. Say if maybe if you had like a terrace landscape, that might be an option for you there. Step three, determine the shape and size of your rain garden. You can really make it uh, almost any shape you want to. The size is gonna be the more important thing. Uh, and the general rule of thumb, especially if you're just dealing with the size of a rain garden you would have for a residential area, is you want uh, uh, the size to be, the area to be about a third of the size of the impervious surface that's gonna be draining to your rain garden. So like Jane had mentioned, uh, looking at the footprint of your roof, say if you're gonna have uh, a rain garden is going to capture the, uh, the runoff from your roof. You know, top down view, what is the area of uh, the footprint of your roof? Divide that by three, and uh, then you could um, make your rain garden that, that size. Same if you're accepting rainwater from a driveway or something else. So then uh, after you determine your shape and size, location, whether any amendments are needed, uh, you can either excavate, uh, dig a little hole or deep depression. Uh, others will add a, a berm, say if they already have a slope, then sometimes it's easier to build a berm on the downhill slope uh, to create that depression shape. So it just kind of depends on the topography of your property, what you're already working with, and the direction water wants to flow. Step five, and this is uh, it's not required, but I really do highly encourage you to choose native plant species uh, for multiple reasons. So what are some native plants that we can use for rain gardens? Uh, well, first of all, let me go into a little bit about why native plants are better to use. For one thing, a lot of the native plant species that uh, we would like to use in these are gonna be uh, prairie grasses. These prairie grasses tend to have very deep root systems. They have evolved these deep root systems to help them get through those dry summer months, um, you know, to be able to get deeper into the soil to the groundwater table when that groundwater table has gone down after it hasn't rained in a while. Uh, and so that's gonna really be uh, uh, beneficial when it helps to uh, facilitate more uh, drainage uh, through uh, the, the soil. Uh, what happens is, you know, water can drain. There's gonna be a little bit of a gap between the surface of the root and the surface of the soil. Uh, water's able to drain through there. Also, as plants die or roots die and they decay, uh, they're gonna leave these channels of where they once were. And that's another way for uh, rainwater infiltrate over time. It's because they, they're really great for just uh, facilitating more uh, drainage. Um, also, uh, because of these deep root systems, they're going to be more drought resistant uh, than many of our non native species. Uh, so, also, these deep root systems are great for holding the soil in place. Uh, and also, because they infiltrate more, or because they facilitate more infiltration. Uh, this is going to help uh, reduce runoff and remove more pollutants before they're able to uh, enter into our local waterways and water bodies. Uh, because they're more drought resistant and they're already adapted to our local uh, levels of precipitation in a normal year, uh, then you typically would need less water for irrigating uh, in order to uh, keep them healthy. You know, we grow a lot of grass lawns uh, that may not be adapted uh, to the climate we have here. We have to spend the winter, or I mean, sorry, the summer months watering our lawns and other gardens and whatnot. Uh, but you think about it, nobody goes out and waters the prairie. Nobody's been watering the forest for the last, you know, thousands, millions of years since it's, you know, been here in North America. That's because these plants are already adapted to our local climate. Now, that's not to say that if you want to include a species that maybe likes a little wetter feet, uh, normally it's adapted to uh, like a low area, like a swamp or wetland or something, and you want to grow it in a drier area, you can do that and you will have to irrigate for that. Uh, but that's really where choosing the right species for the site is going to help if you're wanting to reduce your water usage, uh, which is uh, beneficial for, for multiple reasons. Also, native plants that are already adapted to our local soils, which tend to be pretty poor in nutrients, you know, it's, uh, and so 
actually too much nutrients are often too bad for native plants. When I first got into growing native plants, I lived in an apartment at that time and I would have to grow in containers. Uh, and I found that uh, buying that miracle Grow soil was way too rich for the species I was trying to grow. And they would do what's called lodging. They would grow too tall and then they would fall over. Uh, it's like putting them on steroids where they just grow really fast, uh, really tall, and it's taller than they're really meant to be. So um, just keep in mind that uh, they're already adapted to the poor soils that we have here. Uh, and so because of this, this really helps reduce the amount of fertilizer we're having to put on the land uh, and then there's other benefits from that come from using less fertilizer because there's less nutrients in our runoff, less nutrient pollution and local water bodies and waterways, and which means less eutrophication, which means less algal blooms, which means less fish kills. I mean, it's just a cascading effect when we add too many nutrients to the landscape. And we already see uh, the effects of that down in the Gulf of Mexico when the Mississippi River is bringing all those nutrients from its watershed, which covers you know, almost all of North America, uh, especially where we're already growing uh, crops and whatnot. Uh, and then you know, these nutrients get out into the Gulf of Mexico, cause these algal blooms when these algae, algae die, uh, the microorganisms that break them down, consume all the oxygen in the water, and then there's no dissolved oxygen left for fish and other aquatic organisms to breed. So then they die. And then that also impacts uh, the fishing industry down in the Gulf of Mexico. So um, just anything that we can do to reduce our fertilizer usage is, is better for uh, aquatic ecosystems and also society. Also, because they're already adapted to the local ecosystem, they typically are adapted to a lot of our local native pests that we have here unlike a lot of our non-native species that might uh, attract more pests. And that's not to say that these aren't adapted to our non-native pests. There are non-native pests and insects that can wreak havoc on our na uh, native e uh, plants and ecosystem because our native plants don't have those resistances. But uh, those non-native pests can also be uh, an issue for our non-native vegetation as well. But since we're using uh, native vegetation that have these adaptations to a lot of the native pests, uh, applying less pesticide, um, insecticide and whatnot, or um, you know things, uh, fungicide uh, is also beneficial because uh, there's less of that getting into the runoff and entering the local ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, and there's less of an opportunity for there to be public contact uh, with those and then less uh, health effects that might result from that uh, exposure. Then when we're using non, I mean, sorry, when we're using native species, we're reducing the number of non-natives and invasives that are getting to the environment. A lot of the invasive species that we struggle with today and that seem to be uh, just taking over certain areas were originally introduced for good reasons. You know, kudzu was used for erosion control at one time um, and they didn't really know or think about the, you know, that would become invasive at some point. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, I mean, when I was a kid, I used to love pulling apart those flowers and, you know, tasting the sweet nectar inside there, you know, and I love the smell of them. I can totally see why, you know, they were once you know, used as an ornamental. Uh, but now that I know uh, the negative or adverse impacts that they have on the ecosystem uh, and our native vegetation, uh, native wildlife, uh, I've, you know, I was very disheartened to find that out. But yeah, I can, I can see why it's being banned in, in so many areas. Um, but if we only stick to the vegetation that's native here, uh, then we won't uh, introduce unintentionally any future invasives uh, without uh, thinking about it or, you know, accidentally. Also, since uh, native plants are already part of the local ecology, they're providing nectar for pollinators such as hummingbirds, butterflies, moths, uh, and other bird species as well. Many of these species rely on native species for their resources they need to live and complete their life and reproductive cycles. In short, they're already a part of the local web of life. So when we develop an area and we remove the native vegetation that was there and we replace it with a parking lot or a building or an apartment complex or a house, uh, one thing that we can do to help patch back in a little bit of what used to be there, it's not going to be the same, but it does help if we use some native vegetation, at least one or two of those threads of life are being woven back in to the landscape. Uh, it's not going to be the complete web, like I mentioned, that was once there, uh, but it's better uh, than not having any native vegetation. So. And that's pretty much what I just said. So I'll skip this slide. All right, so how do we determine which native species we want to use at our site? Well, 
let's look to nature. Where does that species like to grow or where does it grow best in the natural environment? You know, some plants, they will grow in some locations, but not very well, they struggle. Other plants, they thrive in other locations. And that's what we want to consider is what does that species really like? And a lot of the three things you're going to think about for the most part are going to be the soil moisture, soil pH, and the level of sunlight. So I'm going to start off with soil moisture, especially since we're uh, discussing rain gardens here. This is going to be one of the uh, important factors. Uh, and what I want to really, really want to encourage you to do is learn about what are called these wetland indicator statuses, because these are great uh, guides to determine whether where a, uh, a species could be placed on the landscape, uh, you know, relative to the amount of moisture it's going to be in the soil there. So if you look up a species, say on plants.usda.gov, uh, you type a species in. In this case, I have uh, an example, Quercus alba, which is the white oak. And you'll see a set of tabs up there at the top. If you click on wetland, uh, that will take you to another screen, which I'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, but before I go to the next slide, I also want to say, if you want to go straight to the source uh, for this information, I have a link down there in the lower right-hand part of my screen. Uh, wetlands-plants.usace.army.mil. Uh, and this list is developed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers uh, for wetland scientists such as myself. Uh, when we are, one of the things I do professionally is I have to figure out where the boundaries of a wetland is. And to do that, uh, I have to look at the vegetation, the soil, uh, and some other factors as well. Uh, so they have developed this list based on where um, which species are considered wetland species, uh, which species are considered upland species, and then uh, what degree of wetland or upland species are they. So, uh, but if you click on that wetland tab, uh, you'll notice that there are different regions in the U.S. where uh, white oaks are known to grow. We are considered to be located in the eastern mountains and Piedmont region. Uh, and then there's a wetland indicator status, uh, and I'll go into those here in a little bit, but basically the FACU stands for facultative upland. So they consider a uh, white oak in the Eastern Mountain and Piedmont region, and apparently in all the other regions it grows in as well, to be a facultative upland species. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in just a second. But here's a map of the Eastern Mountain and Piedmont region. They put the interior highlands of Arkansas um, and that lump it in with the Appalachians because our topography and climate is very similar. Uh, if you're at another part of Arkansas, like Eastern or Southern Arkansas, you're considered to be in the Atlantic and Gulf Coastal Plain. So going back to my last slide, you can see above Eastern Mountain of Piedmont, Atlantic Gulf and Gulf Coastal Plain. If you live in another part of the country uh, or working in another part of the country, you need to look up uh, what um, uh, region uh, you, you, you would, that, place would be, uh, according to the Corps of Engineers. They have it divided up by uh, different eco uh, regions and climate and based on various factors. So uh, the different, uh, there are five different wetland indicator statuses. And keep in mind, just because it says wetland indicator status doesn't mean it's necessarily a wetland plant. Uh, so you have UPL, which stands for an upland. These are plants that are going to like to be uh, in well-drained soils. You find them on the tops of hills. You find them in areas that stay dry. 99% uh, of the time. Uh, just below that is a facultative upland species. It can, can handle a little bit more moisture, but they typically still like well-drained dry soils. Facultative species, they're kind of in the middle. They can handle uh, moist soil. Uh, they can handle dry soil, um, but they really don't like it too wet or too dry uh, all the time. Uh, facultative wetland species can handle a little bit more moist soil. Uh, but uh, definitely couldn't handle uh, growing in the same location as, say, a facultative upland species. And then obligate wetland species, these are the species that you see, like cattails, button bush, uh, swamp milkweed, that they're going to like wet feet almost all the time. They can handle very brief dry periods, uh, not much at all. Uh, you know, the soil pretty much needs to stay saturated. Uh, they, 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 yeah, they like to stay wet. That's why they tend to grow on the edges of ponds, uh, edges of streams and whatnot, uh, where it stays pretty wet. So here's a diagram showing you where on the landscape in relation to uh, the water level that these different uh, indicator statuses are gonna be found. So uh, if you see here, the low water, uh, you know, that's after it has not rained, you know, heat of the summer, but you still have some low standing water. And you can see that the obligate wetland species are still gonna be right there. They can also handle average water levels and high water levels. So move a little further out from that, facultative wetland species, 
Uh, they're going to do fine uh, during low water conditions at the water levels uh, below, uh, not at the surface. Uh, they can do fine when the average water level uh, is below the surface, uh, but the high water level, they can handle that as well. Uh, they can handle that uh, periodic inundation uh, during the high water. Same with some facultative species as you move a little further out past that. Uh, facultative upland species are not going to be able to handle high water at all. So whenever you're designing a rain garden, I want you to consider um, what the periodicity is of the water flowing through your rain garden. If you're just catching water from the roof of a house, that's gonna be some pretty ephemeral flow. So you're probably looking at something that's gonna be closer to like a facultative species that can handle that occasional high water, uh, but that aren't, uh, it's not gonna stay inundated. Uh, throughout most of the year or even during low water conditions. If you're planting something that's uh, maybe closer to a pond to where that water table is going to be uh, pretty close to the surface, even during uh, the dry part of the year, say like next to a lake, uh, you can probably get away with some facultative wet species or obligate uh, species as long as those roots are getting down into that water table. Um, you know, if you're planting a rain garden, you've got to think about the berm. If you have a berm around it, you might include facultative upland species because if that water level, you know, it's not going to fill up that rain garden to uh, uh, inundate those species, those might be just fine. So, I mean, you can get a range within a rain garden, but I just want you to consider well, how much water is going to be going through there and how long is it going to be around throughout the year when you're deciding uh, which species uh, to place. Uh, again, this is a lot of what I just said. These low areas on landscape that are, that are poorly drained and that stay wet. Uh, you can use these species, pond edges, edges of streams, and uh, maybe the low area of the rain garden if you think it's going to stay wet long enough. And then again, you could also, you know, irrigate during the dry months if you have a button bush plant in that low area. Uh, that's one other thing you could do. Facultative species uh, will do a little bit uh, better in these ephemeral uh, rain gardens. Uh, north facing slopes here in the Ozarks where it does not get sun, uh, and so it stays shady throughout the day. Uh, there's less uh, evaporation of soil moisture, and so those soils on these north slopes can often tend to be uh, have a little bit more moisture uh, as opposed to the south-facing slopes, which are going to evaporate and dry up uh, much more, especially during the dry season, the hotter, hotter parts of the year. Uh, these facultative species are also good for these transition zones between areas that stay dry all the time and stay wet all the time, so kind of an in-between area. Um, and then facultative and upland species, these are going to do much better on uplands and hilltops. Like I mentioned, these south and west facing slopes, and then in sandy or well drained soils, depending on if it's already a species that likes or can handle sandy soil. All right, so what about sunlight duration? Well, native plants that are going to like full sun are those that have evolved uh, in prairies and glades. Uh, these are areas that stay open and sunny, and uh, the plants that uh, are found there are typically ones that uh, enjoy those conditions. Uh, so planting locations are going to be uh, if you have a rain garden in, a, in an open area on a south facing slope, maybe you have some terracing uh, and it's not uh, getting shaded out by other trees or the south side of your house or building. So some native flowers that enjoy full sun and I want you to notice here that I've included the wetland indicator status uh, for the species uh, here that I'm going to be discussing. So cardinal flower, uh, great blue labellia. These are both facultative wetland species. Uh, they bloom oftentimes starting in uh, you know, July, August, uh, and you'll see them a lot along creek beds, ephemeral drainages, uh, in uh, or seeps in areas that are constantly um, putting out water uh, long enough throughout the year, but that might dry up occasionally. Uh, butterfly milkweeds, more of an upland species, like some uh, better drained soils and open sun. Swamp milkweed, like I mentioned, is an obligate wetland species. Ohio spiderworts, facultative, so it can handle uh, some, you know, periods of wet, periods of dry. Uh, it's a good uh, plant for uh, that. Can't handle it when it gets uh, just inundated for too much um, or if it stays too dry for too long. Uh, New England aster, another facultative wetland species. Prairie blazing star, uh, facultative species. Then some native grasses for full sun include switchgrass, which is a facultative species. 
That's a great one for rain gardens. And I'll go into a little bit of the other benefits that switchgrass provides here in a little bit. Uh, Eastern gamma grass, which is one you see a lot along stream banks and in lower areas of the landscape uh, is a facultative wetland species. And the interesting one about Eastern gamma grass is it's thought to be one of the ancestral plants of maize or corn. Uh, little blue stem, a facultative upland species. Uh, so it's gonna like a little bit drier areas. So if you include it in a rain garden, might include it uh, in a little bit higher location, like up on the berm or like an edge of your rain garden where it doesn't get inundated or soaked or saturated. Common rush, facultative wetland species, and then scouring rush, another facultative wetland species that uh, both like more moist soil. And then some native shrubs that like full sun, false indigo bush. Uh, it's a facultative wetland species that you see a lot growing in wet areas along stream banks. Uh, common button bush, another one they see growing uh, close to the water on stream banks or in the water or along the edges of ponds, uh, and it's an obligate wetland species. And elderberry is a facultative species. Uh, you often see it growing in areas. Uh, if it's on a stream bank, it's usually going to be a little bit higher up, um, but uh, it's not to say it couldn't uh, uh, have a little bit wetness from time to time. American beauty berry is another facultative upland species that likes full sun. All right, so what about native plants for full or partial sun? Uh, well, these are gonna be plants that evolved in either open woodlands where, or savannas where the canopy is not closed along forest edges where it might get uh, sun in the first part of the day and then the uh, second part of the day it's shady. Uh, and sometimes prairie plants are gonna be able to handle some partial sun. You gotta think some of these had to adapt to you know, you know, getting shaded out just periodically uh, from time to time. So um, that's not to say that if it's a prairie plant, it can't handle uh, a little bit of shade, uh, but it's not gonna be able typically to handle a full shady environment all the time. Uh, locations you might consider for these sorts of uh, plants are gonna be uh, the east or west side of the building, uh, or if you happen to be on the south side, uh, but there's a tree next to your, uh, the location of your rain garden that might provide shade for part of the day. Uh, that should probably be fine as well. So what are some native flowers that can handle this partial sun? A couple we've already talked about is cardinal flower and great bulabelia. A uh, purple cone flower, uh, notice it does not have a wetland indicator status. Uh, and these uh, statuses were really developed for delineators, wetland delineators such as myself. Uh, so if uh, you come across a species that does not have uh, a wetland indicator status, you can generally assume that it's an upland species. Um, so uh, they, if it's a wetland species, they would tend, they would, you know, most likely have already looked at it and uh, decided on what status it needed. So um, they haven't gone through every single species as of yet. So there are still some um, that just um, they have not come to, but those are usually pretty few and far in between. Spotted jewelweed, another facultative wetland species that likes uh, partial sun. Uh, this is a fun one. Uh, just uh, also called touch me not because those seed pods you can try to touch them, uh, but if they're ripe, they will unfurl um, and have this uh, dispersion mechanism of you know just exploding and sending all their seeds all over the place. So that, that's a real fun one, especially if you have kids. A uh, little blue stem uh, and river oats, these are both facultative upland species that can handle uh, partial sun. If you recall, a little blue stem is one that can handle full sun as well. Common rush, uh, another one I'd mentioned uh, earlier, I believe that like full sun, it can also handle some partial sun and it has uh, some other benefits that I'll discuss here shortly. Native shrubs for partial sun include elderberry, which I mentioned before, and red buckeye, a uh, facultative species, uh, produces these beautiful red flowers in the springtime, usually in May around here, uh, which in, they attract hummingbirds. Those uh, long trumpet shaped red flowers are perfect for hummingbird beaks especially adapted for hummingbird beaks. Uh, so, um, you know, if you like hummingbirds, that's a great one to include uh, in your rain garden. Uh, American beautyberry, uh, another facultative upland species that I mentioned like full sun, also likes, uh, can handle some partial sun and seem to do, do pretty well. All right, so what about native plants for full shade? Uh, these are gonna be species that are adapted to these uh, forests with a closed canopy where they're just in the shade uh, throughout the day and throughout the year. Uh, you know, you might place these on the north side of a house or building if it's against the building, uh, close enough to it anyway, uh, that the building's going to provide shade throughout the day or on north facing slopes. 
And generally these species, uh, especially the ones from forest, are gonna be adapted to a slightly more fertile soil uh, than the others. Uh, so, uh, you know, you might add just a little bit of compost or leaf litter or something like that uh, on it uh, to provide a little extra nutrients. Still wouldn't go with miracle Grow though. So what are some native wildflowers that like full shade? Uh, well, some facultative uplands are gonna be including, uh, are gonna include Solomon seal and wild geranium. Uh, Ernest spiderwort is another uh, great spiderwort species. Uh, it, uh, like Ohio spiderwort, uh, produces those three petaled flowers. It tends to grow much, much shorter and it, uh, blooms usually about a month ahead of Ohio spiderwort. Uh, then again, purple pine flower can handle some full shade as well. Uh, native grasses for full shade. Uh, I had mentioned river oats in that last uh, section on partial shade. It can handle full shade as well. Uh, Virginia wild rye is one of our native rye. It's a cool season grass, uh, just like the other wild rye, such as uh, bottle brush grass and Canadian wild rye, and uh, it can handle uh, full shade as well. And it's a facultative wetland species. You send, uh, I see it a lot growing uh, along uh, stream banks and whatnot. Uh, some native shrubs for full shade. Uh, Northern spice bush, another great one. I see it growing a lot along stream banks and along north slopes that stay shady. It's a facultative species. Uh, pawpaw is a facultative species and wild hydrangeas, a uh, facultative upland. One of the interesting thing about these wild hydrangeas is these false flowers that they have around their edges. Uh, and those are just to attract insects and pollinators. Uh, too closer to the flower head. And then when they get there, they realize that the little tiny flowers between them are, are where the goods are. Those false ones have uh, offer nothing. Uh, they have no scent or anything. They're just there. Uh, it's like signposts pointing to those smaller flowers. All right, so what are some design considerations uh, when you're designing your, or planting your rain garden? Well, grouping uh, species uh, of the same type together is going to be good uh, just because it's more pleasing to the eye, uh, helps draw the eye to certain areas instead of just having like an even mix of all the species. Sometimes, you know, that's just, um, you know, aesthetically, uh, generally they, uh, uh, you know, people are advised by landscape architects or whatnot to just kind of keep them group or linear, or, you know, somehow have that design to it. Also floral layering, consider uh, when a species is going to flower, the time of year, not everything flowers at the same time. Some species flower in spring, other species flower in summer, other species flower in late summer and fall. Uh, so the ones that typically flower later in the year are going to be taller. The ones that flower early in spring are usually shorter. Uh, so just consider that and how you uh, lay things out uh, because, you know, you might not want to uh, block out some, uh, you know, um, you know, that just might uh, help with determining uh, where you place things and what species you include as well. If you, especially if you're wanting um, to have color throughout the year, because those spring ones are, you know, they're going to, you know, be done uh, usually, you know, by late spring and then uh, summer, you're going to have a whole new set of species. Also annuals or biannuals or perennials, you know, we have annual species that are going to tend to produce a lot of seeds. Uh, and those are going to uh, receive themselves, and so those might be shifty as far as, uh, you know, when you might have more in one location one year or the other. And so this is going to be a little less well behaved than, say, your perennial species, which are going to stay in one spot. These perennial species, though, will often take a little bit longer uh, to establish themselves and start putting out their flowers. Uh, but once they do, uh, once they're established, then uh, they're usually pretty solid. Uh, and also, I want to encourage you to select species that are able to improve storm water quality. And uh, this is where I want to talk a little bit about phytoremediation. So what is phytoremediation? Well, that's the use of plants and the natural processes that plants have uh, to improve uh, or break down or degrade contaminants in soil, water, air, etc. Uh, plants are great at breaking down low to moderate levels of uh, contaminants such as petroleum that might be in the soil or have been contained and runoff from say a parking lot, a roadway or driveway. Um, and so um, the way this works is their roots uh, exude uh, compounds that stimulate microbial activity in that root zone. Uh, and so the root, uh, these microbes, you know, this petroleum, they're hydrocarbons. So that's food for uh, many species of microorganisms that then eat them, break them down into less toxic substances. Um, all plants have the ability to do this for low to moderate levels of petroleum contamination. When you start getting above a certain area, 
our level of contamination, then the plants aren't going to be able to grow. Uh, the thing that uh, when you're trying to use um, the roots to break down contaminants is you want to choose species that have very fibrous root systems. So you check out this uh, chunk of prairie grass here, uh, standing this, uh, by this uh, gentleman here in this picture. You can see how fibrous that root system is. So the surface area of that root system uh, takes up a much greater volume of the soil than say a species that might have thicker or like tap roots or something like that. Uh, now, I mean, you're still gonna get a little bit of phytoremediation and break down these contaminants around uh, a tap root, but it uh, doesn't take up as much of the volume of the soil as uh, a lot of our prairie grasses and other species with more fibrous root systems. So let me go a little bit into just some different species and all the different things that uh, research has shown that they have the ability to remediate through various mechanisms. So uh, cattails, uh, they're great for sequestering lead uh, in their roots. Um, in the root zone. So they can also break down uh, pesticide atrazine, which is one of the pesticides that is used uh, sometimes uh, in residential areas. Uh, it's also good for uh, uh, breaking down and degrading uh, certain chlorinated solvents, uh, such as uh, sulfonate chloride. And then this first one here, I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Well, I'll try to pronounce it, but I'm going to butcher it. Dota sil linear alcohol ethoxylate. Uh, I may have not pronounced that correctly. Arrowhead uh, is another, it's just an obligate wetland plant. It likes wet feed, as you can see where it's growing here, uh, but it is a great one for breaking down petroleum products contained in runoff. Common duckweed, uh, this is uh, the one you see growing at the base of the arrowhead here. A lot of people don't really understand how uh, valuable this species is. Some people look at it, they call it pond scum. Uh, now it can uh, arise when you have too much nutrients and uh, running off into a pond, but it is also able to break down um, pesticides such as copper sulfate, uh, isoproterone, and glyphosate, Roundup. It's uh, the only species I'm aware of that they've uh, shown through research has the ability to break down Roundup. So if you see a pond covered in this stuff in an agricultural area where they might be using Roundup, just know that this uh, uh, pondweed here is uh, helping to break that stuff down as if it's run off into that pond. Um, it also is good for taking up and sequestering heavy metals such as chromium and copper. Uh, so that's uh, phyto extraction benefits from this. The only thing is um, to get the benefits of using a plant to remove heavy metals from an environment, you typically either, if it's a herbaceous plant like this, you will need to uh, harvest that and take it somewhere where you can either burn it or compost in a uh, environmentally safe manner or uh, another option is to have woody species like trees that can sequester large amounts of heavy metals into their biomass. Um, so that, there's two ways to go about that. Uh, pondweed, another one that uh, people typically, uh, you know, don't you know, fully appreciate, but it is able to sequester uh, copper contamination and also break down pesticides such as copper sulfate and these other two I'm not even going to try to pronounce. Coontail, uh, it's also able to break down pesticides such as metal black core, uh, which is a common one used in um, uh, residential areas. Uh, now, these are gonna be the aquatic species. So let's get a little bit more into some facultative wetland species uh, such as fox sedge. This is a good one. Uh, it's able to uh, sequester copper. Uh, it's also one that I enjoy. I run into it in the field a lot and you know it's one that um, I, I would think would do well in a rain garden. It is a facultative wetland species, so just consider that uh, if you decide to place it in a rain garden. Oval head sedge, uh, great for breaking down petroleum. Same for uh, tussock sedge. And soft rush or common rush, this is one I discussed earlier, like full sun, partial sun. Uh, it's great for breaking down petroleum, contaminated and runoff. Green bull rush. Another one good for petroleum products and runoff. Uh, pale smart reed weed. Uh, this is the one of the, the less uh, invasive persicaria species. There's one that tends to take over in certain areas and that's a non-native one. This is a native uh, smart weed species and it's great for sequestering uh, chromium. And then Easter gamma grass. I'd mentioned this one earlier. Uh, it does, it's a hyper or it's a accumulator of zinc. Uh, so it's great for pulling that if you have an area that is contaminated with zinc. Zinc is one of those contaminants you'll find in uh, along roadsides. It comes from uh, just, uh, 
tire dust that you know as people are driving and it kind of shaves off a little bit of their tires and that ends up on the roadside zinc is uh, one of the heavy metals that uh, we have uh, that will contaminate a roadside uh, it's great for breaking down petroleum and also polychlorinated biphenyls which are pretty persistent in the environment uh, those are it's uh, used a lot uh, with from in electrical motors because it has it's a lubricant with a low heat transfer so it's uh, really great for um, as a motor, um, it was used at one point in time much more prevalently, and it was banned in the 70s, but um, it's so persistent in the environment, a lot of it is still around. Uh, it can also uh, break down certain pesticides. Uh, many of these are also used in residential areas. Uh, switchgrass, uh, it's great for breaking down petroleum, and it's also great for uh, sucking up excess nutrients. So if you have it growing somewhere where fertilizer is being applied, maybe you have uh, an agricultural field and you have a waterway nearby and you know, plant this at the edge of your field, uh, the dense biomass is also going to help trap sediment uh, in that runoff. And then it produces so much biomass that it's really great for sucking nutrients out, uh, excess nutrients out of the soil, incorporate it in that into its biomass uh, before it enters the waterway. Bottle brush grass, uh, one of our cool season wild rice, uh, great for breaking down petroleum. And if you've had a baby with a bottle brush, you can see why it's called bottle brush grass. Look at those seed heads. Uh, Canadian wild rye, another one of our wild rye, and it's also a cool season grass, uh, grows a lot along stream banks, uh, great for breaking down petroleum products. Prairie cord grass, uh, this is a very beautiful one. And look at those seed heads with those little white uh, thready looking uh, flower heads, uh, great for breaking down petroleum and has been shown to have also have the ability to degrade polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs. Little blue stem, I mentioned that one earlier. It's a, you know, like it's a facultative upland species, but it's also good for breaking down petroleum. So you could be used in a rain garden that does not get uh, regular water, maybe just occasionally off of a small surface area, like a driveway, something like that, planted along your driveway and, or along the edge of a smaller parking lot and um, you know it would be able to uh, break down any petroleum contamination in that stormwater runoff. Indian grass, uh, Sorgastrum nutans, uh, great for breaking down uh, petroleum as well as uh, the pesticides altrazine and pendimethylin. This is uh, one of our warm season grass like a lot of our like the uh, blue stems and um, uh, eastern gamma grass so these are going to typically flower and produce their seeds later in the year. Uh, big blue stem, another warm season grass, great for breaking down petroleum, as well as several pesticides that are commonly used in residential areas. Blue gant grandma, uh, also great for breaking down petroleum. It's much shorter, um, and, uh, but it does produce these attractive looking seed heads. The false indigo bush, uh, great for uh, sucking up excess nutrients, and it is also able to extract high amounts of copper and lead. So. And the eastern red bud, also good for breaking down petroleum, uh, produces, you know, this is going to be a small, um, you know, understory tree, almost like a large shrub, more of a tree than a shrub, produces these beautiful pink flowers, almost purple in April, uh, and then the seed pods. Um, so um, you might consider uh, using that in your yard or somewhere that might be receiving runoff from an impervious surface that automobiles are using. Uh, black willow, uh, great for breaking down petroleum, great for sucking up excess nutrients. It's a phreatophyte, has a high growth rate. Uh, and so uh, these phreatophytes that have these high growth rates, especially the woody ones, are great for uh, taking up uh, heavy metals and excess nutrients incorporated into its biomass um, you know, for that purpose. So also it's been shown to be able to break down the pesticide ventizone. Sandbar willow, uh, some of the same things, petroleum, excess nutrients, can also suck up cadmium and zinc, and has also been shown to have the ability to break down polychlorinated biphenyls. River birch has this beautiful papery shredded uh, type bark. Uh, you know, it's really important for wildlife. Uh, it can also break down PCBs, suck up extra nutrients, and has been shown to be able to break down bentazone. Willow oak, uh, wood tree, the leaves do look similar to willows, but they produce acorns. It is an oak, uh, can also break down petroleum and is also a phreatophyte that is great for sucking up excess nutrients in an area. 
black locust. Uh, it can break down petroleum and it's also good for air quality. It is, they did a study um, on, uh, uh, forget 80 different species. Uh, most of them were non-native. There's only one of these uh, that was native to uh, the Ozarks that was shown to also have the ability to take in, a, to assimilate a lot of NO2, nitro, what is it, nitrous, nitrogen dioxide, uh, but also have a high resistance to tissue damage from NO2. NO2 does a lot of damage to plants. Most of them can't handle high levels of NO2, which is commonly uh, in so, uh, pollutant that comes a lot from exhaust and whatnot, uh, but black locust was shown to be able to assimilate a lot of NO2 and have high resistance to tissue damage from that uh, organic compound. Uh, so this is one that's great for uh, improving air quality. So I'd like to see, you know, the, there are thorns on it, but they're very, very small. They're not like a honey locust where you have these large thorns. Uh, typically a black locust isn't going to be uh, too big of an issue uh, on that and it produces these beautiful white flowers in the spring. Red mulberry, another one that uh, is good for breaking down petroleum and uh, PCBs and has been shown to be able to degrade anthracene. Common hackberry, another one that's good for breaking down petroleum. Eastern cottonwood, uh, this is another phreatophyte, so it's great for sucking up nutrients, it can break down petroleum, and then uh, they've done research showing that it has the ability to grade a wide range of various pesticides. Uh, most of these are used within residential areas, uh, as well as chlorinated solvents. So uh, you got PCE, TCE, which are um, you know, commonly uh, waste products from the dry cleaning industry. So um, you know, a lot of times when you have these historic area or historic dry cleaning operations, um, you'll often find uh, soil contaminated with these chlorinated solvents. Uh, also areas where they're uh, cleaning engines, whatnot, rail yards, this sort of space of degreasers, uh, where they're using degreasers and stuff, uh, you'll find uh, soil contaminated chlorinated solvents. And uh, so these, this is one of those species that's able to break those down and improve soil quality. Um, okay, that's a copied slide. So about managing your rain garden. Uh, well, it's easiest to plant in either spring or fall for easier establishment. If you have shrubs or woody species, you know, those are going to be easier when they're dormant. It's less of a shock to the plant. Uh, but if you plant in the summertime, uh, you know, it's going to be a little riskier just because it's usually dry. And, you know, you seem to make sure that, uh, what you plant is getting water. Uh, the first one to two growing season, make sure it's getting enough water, but once they're established, you know, they're usually pretty good uh, and they'll require a lot less. It's just kind of getting them established. Uh, maintain a three inch mulch layer that helps retain moisture or establish ground covers to prevent weeds. The thing about a mulch layer to consider is in a rain garden, especially if you're going to have some flashy heavy flows like we're starting to get, I'm almost uh, hesitant to encourage that just because that will wash away. Um, you know, but, you know, ground covers, um, you know, are going to be, you know, something you might want to consider. Once things are established in there, that'll help shade out any of these less desirable species. And just to give a plug for a group that uh, I also represent is Wild Ones. We have a website where you can find lists of species that you can use for various, native species that you can use for various applications. Uh, check out our local Ozark chapter, ozark.wildlands.org. We are all about trying to, we're a nonprofit, all about trying to get um, more natives into the landscaped and built environment. So this is, um, we have a site committee where we have volunteers that will come out to your house uh, and, um, you know, advise you on which species would grow well. Uh, given the site conditions uh, on your property. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Ozark Wild Ones. Uh, like I mentioned, our website, we have other resources like a list of where you can uh, get species. Uh, and then, you know, we have a quarterly journal that we publish on our website as well. Uh, and then you can email me if you want to get signed up on our email list. And so we also have monthly webinars on how to um, use native plants uh, for landscaping uh, and whatnot. So wild ones, Ozark chapter at gmail.com. With that, I'll conclude my presentation and if anyone has any questions. Yes, Eric, thank you so much. Um, there are there are a few questions in the in the chat area that I'm going to relay over to you. And I think you just might have answered this, at least part of it. Um, 
where can a homeowner find a consultant to help identify appropriate natives for their site and how much might those services cost? Yeah, well, we do this for free. So we have volunteers that come out and uh, help this, help with this. Um, this is our site visit committee. Uh, so we have a form on our website. You go to ozark.wildones.org uh, and go to, I believe it's site visit info. And there's a, a link on there with a Google form you can fill out. Just have some basic yeah. information about your that. property. He's uh, wrapped up. He's answering questions. Uh, yeah, I'm going to mute you, Lisa. Um, and we just need to, um, um, there's a Google, it just has some basic questions about your property and then that will send an email uh, to um, our site committee chair who will then reach out to you to set up a time if they're not able to help you through email, so. Great, hey, great service, thank you. Um, another question is um, about layering the materials from the root of the rain garden to the top, about 24 inches deep. Is that, that's a question from Lisa? I'm sorry, Dalton, what, what was the question? Uh, it, she says, I have a question about laying the materials from the booth of the rain garden to the top, about 24 inches deep. Maybe she means bottom rather than bottom. booth. Yeah. It's a typo. Well, actually, it's, uh, it's unless from, the booth is something that I'm unaware of. It's it's from it's from John, and I was trying to be as concise as I could, as you oh, can tell. Okay. This <laughs> this is not Lisa. So <laughs> the idea is, um, in the process of establishing a rain garden, I'm going to go down about 24 inches, and I'm trying to learn what's the best materials to place at the bottom. And then, because it's very clay soil here when you get down about 24 inches, so I don't want that sitting at the bottom. Sure. And I'm trying to understand what needs to go at the bottom and then progressively the layers up to the top. Right, yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the site specific, I mean, and there are, uh, one thing you could do, uh, you know, like I mentioned, there, there are ways to change the texture of the soil, you know, that requires you to be able to kind of mix in some of that into that clay, which is going to be tough. Um, if you were able, sometimes you can uh, dig a little deeper and put in some, I mean, like, you know, here at Craft and Toll, when we'd have our engineers design a rain garden, they put like engineered soil in there. So, um, you know, that's usually going to be designed specifically, you know, for certain criteria, certain drainage, whatnot, depending on what they calculated, you know, they could expect to be flowing through there. So uh, for a small residential grain, grain garden at your house, um, you might just, uh, you might, if you, you know, if you're wanting your rain garden to be 24 inches, well, that's, that's going to be pretty deep. So yeah, I mean, you might just add like a sandy loam or silt loam of some kind. Uh, you don't want it too sandy for certain species, um, you know, but um, sometimes that can be just fine uh, as long as it's just, you know, within the loam range, just, you know, so um, if you buy that soil, um, you know, keep in mind it's going to have its own seed bank uh, with usually a lot of weedy species that like that disturbed area that you might combat, um, but um, but if it's going to be um, clay right below that, I mean, um, I mean, it's either getting it out of there or installing some sort of under drain that's able to go through that clay and out, you know, daylight it somewhere off site or outside of your rain garden. Would it would it be helpful to have someone from your uh, organization do a site visit and look at it and say? Yeah. Um, Cause I, I'm, I know, I know I really want to do this there. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just doing it right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, just go into our website, fill out that form. That's the official process. Uh, yeah. And we can have somebody come out and take a look. That'd be fine. Okay. Yep. That's what you do. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. I'm sorry. I assumed you were Lisa. We're both here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, thank you for answering that, Eric. And I, I've got a question too, um, just to build on that. Again, what is your um, coverage area for offering that service? 
Uh, you know, Benton, Washington County is definitely, uh, if it's somewhere outside of like well, Madison or Carroll County, it's just a ton of matter of uh, finding a volunteer, uh, you know, and a time and all that works for everybody, you know, because it takes a little time to drive out to some of those locations. Uh, but, you know, we have an easier time getting those scheduled uh, for here in the, you know, um, you know, the four city area and, you know, all the little tiny towns in between. So, been to Washington is the, the easiest. But okay. Not to say that it won't happen. It's just a matter of getting it coordinated to the issue. So. Okay, understandable. There, um, there's another question here uh, from Diana. Are there certain techniques to use for established for establishing rain gardens in a sloped area? Um, you know, terracing, if it's really sloped, you know, that's going to help. You know, you might have a set of rain gardens that kind of one kind of drains to the other. Um, and with that, you might consider that that lowest one's going to have water for longer than the highest one. So you might have a different, you know, species that are going to be able to like that wetter soil for a little longer, like some facultative wetland species lower down. Um, another option, you know, depending on the slope without seeing it, I mean, but if it's a more gentle slope then putting a berm on the down slope side, you know, like, you know, kind of like when they create a farm pond, a lot of times they don't always excavate, they just berm up a uh, femoral drainage area, you know, and then as water goes in, it kind of fills in. So that that's not, might be another option that you could use. Uh, I wouldn't recommend that so much if it's a pretty severe slope just because, you know, that's just going to wash out most likely and not be able to hold as much volume of water. So. Okay, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Uh, another question, um, can Jane or Eric talk about the pros and cons of daylight draining versus underground piping? Of what? Uh, the pros and cons of daylight draining versus underground piping. Um, okay. Is this from like thinking about from like a gutter system into uh, through a lawn? A lot of times they go right out to the to the grounds or to the the curb and gutter system of the the street. Um, we we highly recommend disconnecting those um, gutter systems, um, and um, because it does it allows it, instead of channeling that water at the fast speed that you're then moving that momentum down the streets, being even more power to pick up pollutants. Is it trying to get that to to happen um, to keep it? Uh, on your side and your lawn, let your lawn soak up some of that water. Um, some other cities across the United States are uh, being really proactive and actually providing funds um, for homes that were that had done this previously because it's it's um, costing them less in the long term for long term infrastructure, uh, especially as they're starting to put in these regional detention and retention uh, basins. Um, so yeah, we we definitely uh, think that is a a benefit. Um, the, there is a con though is that it, we have flooding issues, um, and so if you start removing those down and that were made to get water away from your home um, and you don't have enough drainage area or if it's back slope to your house again your house can start flooding so there there are pros and cons of daylighting those drain systems um, and the con is, is is regional or localized flooding or even just little mosquito ponds out in your wet spots in your lawn that weren't there before um, if it's like a driveway um, drain that was there previously that you've daylighted um, I recently went to a site visit where somebody was concerned about snakes because there had been a daylighted um, drain um, done by the city and she was thought that that would start attracting snakes to her, to her area. Um, so that is, I guess that's a con to me, it'd be a pro. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> less, less mice, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so that's one. Um, and then also I, I wanted, uh, there was a question that I kind of started answering back and forth um, in the chat, Eric, while you were pre presenting and it was about, um, about kind of that photoremediation and, and if, if you put edibles, if we're using runoff for edibles, um, and the example was given out actually with the pawpaw. Um, so you recommend it putting a pawpaw in a rain garden, but is, is, is there a harm in eating a pawpaw that's using runoff that we don't know maybe what's in there? I don't know. I mean, I don't know what studies have been done on pawpaws. Uh, the thing about I would be more concerned with eating something from the contaminated runoff is going to be uh, inorganic contaminants like heavy metals and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times those heavy metals, uh, depending on what they are, will stay in the root of a plant. Sometimes they do get transported up to other parts of the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, so it really depends on um, you know, I would do your research, um, 
because like somebody like myself who enjoys foraging wild edibles, I didn't ever even thought about it until I started learning about phytoremediation and learning, oh, cattails, you know, people love eating cattail roots, but, you know, these they might be getting a little dose of lead, you know. Right. Uh, so it's just one of those things, um, you know, we didn't, you know, back when foraging was more what people survived on, that, that wasn't as much of an issue because, you know, those elements were in the ground. You know, but as we start bringing them up, whether it be through for mining and then manufacturing with them or through um, producing pesticides, you know, some sources of these heavy metals are from, you know, when our pesticides break down. Um, and so, it, yeah, I mean, it's something um, that I, I, I that's something I want to learn more about myself. Um, and it's some, definitely something I encourage people to uh, research on their own. But I, I don't know personally of any research on pawpaws as, you know, looking at the contaminants that they might take up so as someone who works for extension every time i hear something like this i'm like grad student i need a grad yeah. student <laughs> right. <laughs> so this, i'm gonna work on somebody to get a grant for that one yeah definitely so yeah well good like question because yeah know, it's, it's called lead plant for one reason but yeah and it's one of those that you know foragers like um but just be careful you know, if you're collecting from a roadway that has been around since uh, when, you know, it's around for a long time when lead gasoline was there. Uh, think about tire dust uh, deposits heavy metals along roadway. So along an interstate, it's going to have a lot of, more of that. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't recommend foraging from those places. And Diana comments that that's why she's hesitant to grow fruit trees within the city limits. I'm sorry? Uh, Diana has a comment in the chat that says that that's why she's hesitant to grow fruit trees within yeah. the city limits. Right. And Eric, I'm, I'm going to put a plug in here for some future programs because you're <laughs> we're talking about edibles and phytoremediation and Eric's going to be with us um, again, I believe it's next month in July to talk about um, Ozark natives um, that are edibles and have medicinal properties. And then this fall, he's gonna be doing a program for the library on um, just on phytoremediation. So those are something, um, some topics that you're interested in. And then uh, Eric's gonna be back and you can come and learn more about those topics too, so. Go much more in depth into either one of those. But yeah, maybe a future topic would be intersecting those two. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's definitely an area I need to learn more about myself. Yeah. So. Great, thank you so much. Thank you. Great info um, and great comments and questions. Thanks everybody for participating. Uh, if there aren't any more questions right now, it's time to take a quick break again and then we'll let Lee take over and talk about green roofs. So um, let's see, let me check the time here. Uh, 405. We're, if we're just doing great, we'll take another just quick break. I will pause the recording and be back in, we'll say five minutes. Is that all right with you, Lee? Yep, that sounds great. Okay, great. Everyone take a quick break, get up and walk around, get a drink, whatever, and we'll see you back here in a few minutes. Thank you. Okay, hey, welcome back everyone. Lee, are you ready to start your presentation on Green Roof? I am ready. Can okay, you hear me? Terrific. Thank you for being here. Yep, we see the, uh, the slides and we can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Um, I want to say thanks for being here today. I know that it's a beautiful day outside. Um, I just checked the weather and it looks like it's 93 degrees. So. Maybe it's actually a nice time of day to be inside rather than uh, rather than outside. And um, also, I've given this presentation a couple times, or uh, given presentations with Jane and Eric a few times. And every every time, I learn something new. So um, thanks, you guys, for having interesting information and and changing it up a little bit every time. So I'm going to talk about green roofs, and I hope that you all learn something new about green roofs or plants or installation. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about low impact development, which we've already talked about a little bit, stormwater, and some of the benefits of green roofs, uh, components of a green roof, 
some green roofs in the US and um, some of the green roofs that Ozark Green Roofs has done here in Northwest Arkansas. A little bit about me and my background. Um, I studied landscape architecture at the University of Arkansas. I worked at the Botanical Gardens of the Ozarks for a little bit and at the city of Fayetteville for a couple of years. I was in the sustainability department and then also worked in the Parks and Recreation Department as an urban forester. Um, hence the ability to talk about HHOD and super nerdy um, grading, commercial development stuff. <laughs> um, I worked at Integrity Partners for a little bit. I still work there part-time as their sites project manager. If you're familiar with LEED, um, if LEED is for buildings, like making buildings, helping buildings be green from the design to the construction phase, um, sites is like that, but for landscapes. So currently I'm working on the Cultural Arts Corridor, which is an awesome project here in Fayetteville. If you have questions about it, I'm happy to talk about it uh, after this presentation. And in 2018, I started Ozark Green Roofs, and I'm so happy to be able to, to do green roofs and um, to be talking with you today about them. So I like to start my presentations by talking about trees. Um, if we were in person, I'd say, can you raise your hand if you've seen this angel oak tree? Uh, I have not seen it in real life, but um, I have seen a tree that's similar to it. It's called the Treaty Oak and it's in Austin, Texas. And they're both about the same age. They're both um, estimated to be around 500 years old. So really old trees, they've seen a lot of history. And throughout that time, they provided a lot of environmental benefits. And that's why I wanna talk about trees just for a second and say, if you're developing a site and you have space to plant a tree, you should plant a tree. I mean, green roofs are awesome and I love green roofs. I think they're great. They're really good for urban environments where you don't have space for trees because they do have a lot of the same ecosystem services. But if you can plant a tree, you should plant a tree um, because yeah, they're, they're silent workhorses for the environment and they, they can do a lot more than green roofs can, even though green roofs are wonderful. And so this is the uh, California Academy of Sciences green roof in San Francisco, which is awesome. Please, we're still seeing your title slide. Are you, um, oh. are you supposed to be seeing some trees? Yeah, sure. Let's see. Um, let me try to stop the share. Oh, here we go. Well, one second. Hmm. Let me try to stop the share and then start it again. Thank you for okay. that heads up. Sure. Um, Maybe I'll try this. How about now? Did it change? Yeah. Okay, so this change. is the slide where I said what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, and this is the slide about me. <laughs> and here is the beautiful slide about the angel oak tree and the California Academy of Sciences green roof. Um, so you can see, yeah, this tree is wonderful. If you have space for a tree, even if you don't have space for this wonderful oak tree, um, you should still plant a tree because they, um, oh, I'm gonna admit this person. They uh, provide a lot of ecosystem benefits. Okay, did we move on to the next slide? Okay, good. So low impact development and stormwater and green roofs. Um, Jane specifically, but in general, we've talked a lot about low impact development today. And the name of the game with low impact development is stormwater. So, um, you know, you can treat stormwater and move stormwater in two ways. One is through hard engineering, as you can see here on the left with the culvert under the road. And one is with soft engineering. Um, you can see with plants and this, this bioswale or this, this roadway ditch in the middle, this median. Um, I'm obviously on team soft engineering, but I think that there is a time and a place for hard engineering. And so, you know, when developing, I think it's important to look at the, the pros and cons of both. And so when you're looking at developing a property or a roadway, um, you know, choosing which tool to use to slow stormwater. So this 
um, diagram here is from this book. I don't know if you can see my face screen, but this is the Low Impact Development Manual from the University of Arkansas Community Design Center. And I think you can find this online for pretty cheap now. It's like 10 bucks or something. But it has a lot of awesome diagrams and pictures of low impact development. And this is one of the diagrams. So as Jane mentioned, um, with low impact development, you're trying to slow the stormwater, spread the stormwater, and soak the stormwater. So this, um, this diagram shows that whole, that whole spread. And on the left side, you can see that there are mostly mechanical or hard engineering ways to slow stormwater. And then on the right side, there are more biological ways. And so this diagram shows um, some of those specific facilities. So on the left for mechanical, uh, mechanical slowing of water, there are oversized pipes or underground detention or re above ground retention ponds. And then um, on the left side, you can see that there are bioswales and infiltration basins and constructed wetlands. So green roofs are somewhere in the middle. So green roofs, while they're not um, while they're not all mechanical, they do still take quite a bit of technical um, technical work because they're on a structure. You have to deal with loads and with waterproofing. But then obviously they are more on the biological end because they have um, plants and soil and um, you know biological material. So again, this is from the LID manual. A great thing to pick up if you are interested. Okay, benefits of green roofs. So here's a list of the environmental benefits of green roofs. They help to um, replace green space, slow stormwater, which is the big thing today. Um, they cool urban heat island temperatures and they increase biodiversity. Uh, this is a picture here of a sedum roof at the Fayetteville Montessori School. And I love in this picture, you'll see it in a few other images as well, how green roofs really help to connect the building to the surrounding landscape. Like I love how they're a, they're a middle ground between a, a hard structure and then you know, the hills. And we're lucky to live here in Fayetteville where there are lots of trees. And so green roofs are a nice transition feature. So the first benefit, uh, replacing green space. I think this picture is, is so cool because it shows that transition just like the Fayetteville Montessori School. You can barely even tell that this is a roof except for the railing there, um, that the, the roof just continues on into the landscape. I haven't seen this in person, but it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful green roof. And for me, um, you know, it clicked about the environmental benefits of green roofs when I heard about replacing green space. It's not necessarily a specific benefit, but encapsulates a lot of benefits. Just the principle of if you have land that's a pasture or a, a prairie, and then you put a building footprint on it, you're taking away the, the benefits that were there of you know, water infiltrating the soil and the biodiversity of plants and habitat for animals. And so green roofs help replace that on, on the roof. So slowing stormwater, um, obviously green roofs help to slow stormwater. Um, this is a diagram taken from Green Roofs for Healthy Cities, which is uh, the national green roof publication. And you can see in this diagram that it outlines how green roofs help to slow stormwater. So the first way is through vegetation. They help to, um, green roofs have plants on them. And so plants help to absorb the water. And like Eric was talking about a lot of the nutrients, um, a lot of the pollutants that might be coming off of roadways, plants help to absorb that. But we don't have that issue on green roofs. It's just, just rainwater being collected. So uh, sedums specifically hold water in their, in their leaves. Um, if you've ever worked with sedums or with succulents, if you press the leaves, they squish and they're mostly water. And so when people talk about green roofs, typically they're talking about sedum roofs. And I'll get into that in a little bit, the, the different types of um, green roofs, but so through evapotranspiration, uh, the vegetation on green roofs uh, helps to hold some of the, the water holding capacity of a green roof. Um, the growing media on green roofs or the soil helps to slow the velocity of water. So um, Jane talked about erosion downstream and green roofs help to slow storm water from hitting a roof, 
gaining speed, gaining velocity as it comes off of a metal roof, hitting the downspout, hitting the, you know, hitting the yard or the, or the road, and then um, going into our, our stream banks and causing erosion. So help to slow the velocity, the speed of water. And then all green roofs have a, or should have a water retention layer. And um, at Ozark Green Roofs, we use a, something called a J drain, which helps to, you can see in this diagram on the left, there are little capsules of water that's stored and they help to store some water, but also help to move it, move it off the roof. Cause you don't want water sitting on your roof. Um, so it can, it can stay in these little pockets, but then because there's a slope on the roof, the water is, is moving off of the roof. And then um, green roofs also help to manage the flow of water. So kind of like Jane talked about, once the water has hit the roof and then gone, you know, some water has been used in evapotranspiration, some has been slowed um, due to the growing media and then also retained, um, you can send that water into a rainwater cistern, a rain barrel, into a bioswale on site or just whatever, wherever it needs to go, whether it's a soft engineering or hard engineering feature. So green roofs help to help to do all that regarding stormwater. And so we talked about environmental benefits. One of the financial benefits is that green roofs help to offset stormwater fees. So a lot of cities and states and countries here, you can see, have um, stormwater fees. It's not as common in the US, but in Germany and Italy, if you have a new commercial development, um, you, you have to pay stormwater fees. And um, basically they look at the amount of permeable surface on your site. And then they give you a, a calculation to figure out based off of the square footage of your site, how much is pervious and how much is impermeable paving or uh, something like concrete or asphalt or your building. And then they give you a, a charge. So I looked up some numbers before this presentation and um, on the lower end, for a residence, the, the highest rate you can expect is $3 uh, per month. I'm sorry, on the, on the low end, it's $3. And on the high end, it's uh, $8 a month. So, you know, it's not a huge amount of money, but it, um, it's still, it still is, is extra every month. And greeners can help offset that. So if you have a green roof on your property, um, the they treat that as if you had a lawn on your property so that the water is, is staying on site and like we talked about being slowed and managed. Okay, um, cooling urban heat island temperatures is one of my favorite benefits of green roofs because it gets freaking hot in downtown areas. You can see this diagram here it shows in rural areas um, could be 85 degrees and in, in a city on the same day with the same, the same amount of sunlight, um, same air quality, it could be 92 degrees. And we all know what it feels like to be in a city when you're, uh, you know, on a road by a concrete building with, or, a, a, you know, a building with windows and it just can, it can be really hot. So green roofs help to offset some of that um, urban heat island impact. And here is a, a picture of, a, what's the word, a thermo, thermo difference um, between, um, this, is, this is a roof in Chicago on the Chicago City Hall. And you can see the difference between a dark roof and then a green roof. So on the left side, you can see the real picture. On the right side, you can see that thermo, uh, thermo picture where it's, uh, what is that temperature? Your faces are over it right now. 74 degrees on the green roof and 151 degrees um, on, the, on the typical black roof. Granted, I think most commercial developments now are using white roofs or TPO roofs, which is which are a lot cooler. Um, still, green roofs help to help to cool additionally on top of that white roof um, and then you know provide other environmental benefits. So green roofs help to cool the urban heat island impact. And of course, uh, green roofs increase biodiversity. So depending on what you put on your roof, um, you can create habitats for, for insects or birds if you, if you want birds. Sometimes that's not advantageous. Like if you are putting a green roof at an airport, you don't want birds 
on your green roof. Um, but even a typical sedum roof is going to help to increase biodiversity on your site. So whoop. real quick, I want to talk about the difference between um, the two types of green roofs in general. Um, I think in Jane's picture, there were three types, and I'll get into that in a second. But in general, there are two types of green roofs. One is an extensive green roof, and one is an intensive green roof. When I first learned about green roofs, I felt like this was backwards, but this is just the way it is. So extensive green roof, I think of as like an exoskeleton. It's a thinner profile green roof. So on this, you'll have two to four inches of soil depth, and then it'll typically house um, uh, sedums or like a, a, those are green roofs, we put wildflowers up there too. So two to four inches of soil and then sedums. This is also called a sedum roof on an extensive green roof. And then an intensive green roof, I remember this, uh, this brain trick because intensive green roofs can hold more intense systems. So um, you're going to have a deeper soil profile, typically six inches and above, and you'll have bigger things like plants and irrigation systems and walkways. And um, you can see on this, on this green roof, on this intensive green roof, they have trees and shrubs and then um, benches and planter boxes and stuff like that. And then in between both of those, there are semi-extensive and semi-intensive and then um, roof meadows and roof gardens. But in general, extensive and intensive are the two types of green roofs. Okay, components of a green roof. Um, at Ozark Green Roofs, these are the components that we, that we typically deal with. Um, plants, growing medium or soil, and a drainage layer. And I have two different pictures of soil here or the growing medium. One is from Roof Light, which is a national green roof company. And one is from Heirloom Soils, which is based out of Siloam Springs in um, Oklahoma, Arkansas, just right, right on the border there. And then um, in the drainage layer images, you can see that this gray and black mat is what we call a J drain. And that's the drainage layer that in the diagram before you saw could retain some water. So those little pockets can hold water, but then they also provide structure uh, beneath the green roof so you can walk on it and it's not, it's not getting compressed. They're strong. And then all of that is on top of the waterproofing layer, which is crucial, but we do not deal with the waterproofing layer at Ozark Green Roofs. That's, that's, on, that's on someone else, on the contractor. Um, so things that are important to consider uh, when you're installing a green roof, whether it's at your house or, um, or somewhere else on a commercial development. Um, we typically look at the soil type and soil depth, because that'll indicate what types of plants you can have. Um, the slope and drainage. The name of the game in green roofs is getting water off the roof. Standing water is, is not a good thing beyond those little pockets of water in the J drain. Um, Maintenance, is this roof going to be maintained by the owner or by the landscaper or by those are green roofs? Um, what's the sun and shade condition? Because you know, just like the soil depth that can, that can indicate what type of plants you'll be able to, to plant. Um, something I call the moisture microclimate. And I think if, you know, if you're from Arkansas, you probably can imagine what I'm talking about pretty quickly. Um, the moisture microclimate to me just means is air stale on your green roof or is air moving? Um, because it can get really humid and really moist on a green roof and um, that can cause some, some different mosses and um, other things to grow that maybe, maybe you don't want growing on your green roof. So making sure that there's airflow on the green roof is a, is a good thing. Is the green roof going to be irrigated or not? Um, like Eric was talking about, if, um, if you choose a certain plant palette, you might not need to have irrigation. Um, if you choose non-natives, you probably will need irrigation. Um, at Ozark Green Roofs, we like to put in a drip irrigation system. Um, a drip irrigation system helps to have the, so that means that there's a pipe of irrigation that has holes in it and it sits right on top of the soil or even just maybe an inch below it and um, you turn on the water and then the water 
goes through the goes through the irrigation pipe and seeps out of the holes. And we think that this is better because up on roofs, it's really hot. So if you had sprinkler systems or, or sprinkler heads, the water is, you know, being pushed out of the sprinkler head, but then some of it is being lost in the air. And then again, with the moisture microclimate thing, um, is the water just sitting on top of the soil? And so we think that a drip irrigation system is better than a sprinkler irrigation system for green roofs. So that's what we typically install. Also, um, you know that it gets really hot in Arkansas. And so if you have a south facing green roof with three inches of soil, it's gonna get really dry up there. You know, if, if we don't have rain for two weeks, it's gonna be hot and dry. So while you don't need to run irrigation all the time on a green roof, and depending on where you live, you might not even need irrigation. While it is wet here in Arkansas, I think it's a best practice to install an irrigation system um, because it helps with the plant establishment. And then, you know, it would be awful to be five years down the road and so proud of your green roof and then have everything die because we had a month of a month of no rain. And when a, a simple, pretty inexpensive drip irrigation system would would have helped prevent that. Um, and then aesthetic, of course, and this is the most fun part. What is the owner want the green roof to look like? What types of plants do you want to use? Um, I'll show you a project in a little bit where the, the client wanted it to be all red, a red green roof. So, um, you know, we, we accommodated that with a certain plant palette. Um, okay, technical considerations. So, like I was showing you in the, uh, in the LID diagram, um, green roofs are kind of in the middle between a biological and a mechanical way to treat stormwater. And these technical considerations are why it's, why it's not, all, not all on the biological end. So what's the weight of the green roof? Um, uh, the dry materials of a green roof. So like we talked about the plants, the soil and the J drain can weigh up to, you know, 20 pounds or 15 pounds on the low end. If you have a thin extensive green roof up to, you know, if you have a tree in one square foot, that's going to be a really heavy green roof. But we say that typically an extensive green roof saturated with water is 50 pounds per square foot. So that's heavy, you know, the 50 pounds per square foot is a lot to accommodate on a roof. So um, we always work with a structural engineer on our projects to review the design before we do our design to say, hey, can these structural members hold 50 pounds per square foot? Because it needs to hold the materials, the water, and then a snow load. So we, I mean, even though we don't get that much snow here, you know, we did get snow last year and snow is water and water is heavy. And then um, also to be able to hold just people walking on a roof. So while we can technically do those calculations, we subcontract that out to somebody else. So um, just to check, check the work and you know double check it because the worst thing would be to have a green roof um, structurally impact, structurally fail. Um, that would that would be awful. So 50 pounds per square foot is what we say for an extensive green roof. Um, slope and drainage. So if you're thinking about um, you know, can your roof hold a green roof uh, based off of the slope? The minimum slope needed is a quarter inch per foot. So um, you're probably thinking, well, my roof is super pitched. Like it's a, you know, it's, it has a roof pitch like this. And so green roofs can go from the, the small end of a quarter inch over a foot all the way up to, you know, there are green walls. And so that's 90 degrees. Um, but the, the, the higher the pitch, um, you might need to put in a type of, it, it looks almost like a hairnet and it helps to hold the soil back. And then honestly, once the plants establish, those, those plant roots serve as um, a way to stabilize the soil. There's just a little bit more that goes into it if you have a pitched roof. It's possible and doable and there are lots of beautiful examples out there. You'll see some here in a minute. Um, but you, like I said before, the name of the game is getting water off the roof. 
So um, another technical consideration is the edge condition. This is always where when working with architects on a project where we, we need to have meetings about this, this part. So how does the waterproofing meet the roof deck? And what is the, the built up edge condition like? Is it, okay, in the top left here on the screen, you can see that there is a black piece of edging with perforations in it. And that's, that's provided by a, a green roof manufacturing company. And that has a certain rate of water that can flow through it. So you can use that as your edge condition and have water flow through that. Or like the picture below it um, with the ladder, that green roof has an edge condition that's built up so that then it's just like a planting bed and you're planting the green roof inside of that planter bed. Um, either works, but it's just, it's a, it's a detail that we always need to consider. Uh, similar to drains, you can see on the, the middle right picture there, there's a roof drain and um, it's important that the roof drains. Um, another technical consideration is lifting soil onto the roof. So are you gonna get a crew of people or have your kids help you uh, get buckets of soil and, and you know really carefully go up the ladder or go up through the house and, and pour the soil on the roof? Or are you going to hire Ozark Green Roofs to use a forklift or, uh, or some equipment to get the soil onto the roof? Soil is heavy. That comes in these two tote, I mean, two cubic yard totes. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute. Um, but they are, yes, they have two cubic yards per tote and they're around 5,000 pounds each. So it's a lot of soil, soil is heavy. And so how to get that onto the roof is um, definitely something to consider in the design phase. And then access, how will you be accessing the roof for installation and maintenance and then waterproofing. The worst thing I mean, beyond the green roof structurally failing is a, a water leak on a green roof. And so when we're working on projects, we make sure that whoever is doing the waterproofing knows that there's gonna be a green roof on it. That normally pings them to do like another layer of waterproofing. And, um, and then we put the green roof on top of that. But it's really important that the waterproofing is, is solid. And typically we suggest a monolithic TPO waterproofing membrane. Okay, so I mentioned that I was gonna show you some green roofs uh, that are at a steep pitch. Let me check my time here. Okay, I got 20 minutes, so I'm gonna go a little faster. Um, I like to talk about some of the original green roofs because I think sometimes when I'm talking with people about green roofs, they think I'm talking about like hobbit homes. And when I see that on their faces, this is what I picture that they're, that they're picturing, um, these, some of these original green roofs. So the first documented green roofs um, historically were here in the Faroe Islands and then some in Norway and these were used as um, you know people used what they had and grass and dirt was around so it was used as a roofing material it wasn't like a cool hip LID feature uh, it was a it was that we have this let's use it thing and you can see all of these are on slopes so these are what we call a sod roof sod roofs um, this one, this set of pictures is from Sweden, except for the bottom right. This is from, um, what's the town called? Uh, Sisters Bay in Wisconsin, and it's called Al Johnson's Swedish Cafe. So, um, it's a, it's a Swedish restaurant where there are goats and sod on top of this indigenous style Swedish roof. Um, I love this picture because it it shows like it's like a, a crossing in time of these old sod roofs here and this is in the Faroe Islands and um, but you can see that these are this is a modern picture and they're using a J drain under there you can see the the black drainage mat and um, yeah it's, it's just a funny picture to me because it's so not OSHA safe like these guys do not have harnesses on helmets or anything, but it's like, it's probably in their jeans and their people have been installing these green roofs for forever. It's no problem. Um, and it's just a beautiful picture. Um, okay, so like I mentioned, sod roofs are what I showed you pictures of the original green roofs. 
and they used as that edging condition like a wooden block the tree bark was the waterproofing they had like support fasteners to to lock in the waterproofing um, logs as structural members and soil like literally topsoil as their um, as their growing medium and then sod as their plants even though I bet there were some people that put you know that took pretty pretty flowers from the woods and put them on their on their roof to you know forge the way for modern green roofs um, and so then on the right you can see the modern green roof detail with plants still here it's turf or sod but then the growing medium and then these next few layers are what Ozark Green Roofs calls the J-drain, and we buy one composite material that has all of this in it. So the root barrier drainage layer protection and another root barrier is called the J-drain. And then in this green roof, they have insulation above the waterproofing, but typically buildings have insulation under the waterproofing as well or under the roof deck. You can still put additional insulation on top of the waterproofing, especially if you want to create like a mound insulation is a great way to do that. So you don't fill that whole mound with soil. Um, you can fill it with insulation and then it's a lot lighter. And then the green roof has the same soil profile. It's just filled with insulation beneath to give you some verticality in, um, in height. Here's some beautiful examples of modern residential green roofs. Um, you can see there's a pitched one in the bottom left with the metal edge condition. Um, and then on the bottom right, you can see that they just built the edge condition up and then put the soil inside. So lots of ways to skin the cat of the edge condition. Um, it's really just based on the aesthetic and the architect and weight and um, you know what the, what the client wants. Okay, green roofs in the USA. I'm gonna try to go quick here. Um, Chicago City Hall is one of the oldest green roofs in the US and so I'm also saying that uh, greeners are relatively new in the United States. Um, this Chicago City Hall was built, green roof was built in um, the year 2000. It was installed in April of 2000. And it's a semi-extensive green roof. It's 38,000 square feet. And this is the one where they had the, the thermal picture, or I had the thermal picture of the dark roof versus the green roof temperature. And Chicago, because it's in Illinois, is one of the cities that has stormwater fees. And so maybe they were doing this as an example to offset some of those fees. This is the American Society of Landscape Architects headquarters in Washington, DC. And this is also a semi-extensive green roof. So it's a little bit thicker than a extensive green roof, a thin profile, but it doesn't have trees. It's not huge. It's just a, it's somewhere in between. And this one was installed in 2006 and it's 3000 square feet. Carnegie Hall, I like this example because it's obviously an old building. This was built in 1891 and um, it was retrofitted with a green roof in 2014 and it's 10,000 square feet. But you can see this is an intensive green roof, a seriously intensive green roof. It has trees, retaining walls, benches, skylights, hostas, boxwoods. It's got a thing that's railing and, and walkway. It's got some pretty heavy things on it. Um, I love this picture. This is the Hotch Hotchkiss School. This is a high school, a really beautiful high school um, in Connecticut. And I think this picture or these pictures are great because they show, you know, a lawn and then the green roof and then the forest and just how, how greeners can serve as a, a layer between the natural and the, the built environment. Okay, I'm going to show you some residential green roofs because that's what we're talking about here, green roofs and home ownership and stormwater. Um, and then I'm going to show you a couple of Ozark Green Roofs um, commercial projects that we did last year. So this is the Park Avenue residence. Um, these are the totes that are really heavy. So here we use uh, machinery to lift the totes of soil on to the roof. This was the middle of winter. Um, this was a, a there were some constraints with the with the whole site on this project and we needed to get the heavy parts in in the winter and then we came back and installed in the plants in the spring. Typically we don't install plants between November and mid-April because green roofs don't have ground heat to keep the plants warm and they also don't have mulch. So 
you're really the green roof is really out there on an island of coldness <laughs> and um and also also gets very hot but um we don't install plants in the winter so this is a winter time installation we did half and half here's the irrigation and then this was day one of the installation you can see we've got back here we have some well, i guess maybe you can't see where i'm pointing but we have some scabiosa and then a line of yuccas and some blue fescue. This bare line has wildflowers in it, a, a mix, and then um, scabiosa. Did I? Oh, I'm sorry, plumbago was back here, not scabiosa. And then this is scabiosa, and then we have a juga. And this was it a couple of weeks after installation. And then this is in June. Uh, the summer after we installed it. So it's looking great, looking bright. And then this was the next year, still looking really cute. And then this was yesterday. I was up on up on the green roof. So you can see there's echinacea and there's some dianthus in here, blue fescue, some uh, balloon flower. You can see the scabiosa back there and the ajuga. So this roof is a little tricky because it's genuinely in part shade and part sun. So we have a juga, which does spread pretty quickly, um, but that's in the shade. And then in the sun, we have really sun loving plants like fescue. And South College Avenue, this was a series of three green roofs that we installed at one time. Um, again, we're not, we're not going up here with buckets. I did that once and <laughs> you'll see pictures of that in a second. It's really only appropriate for a really small roof. So maybe at your house, you could, you could do that and not have to rent equipment. Um, here's the uh, TPO membrane with the drainage on the right side. The roofs are sloped and there are two drains on either corner, two drains with rain chains on either corner of each green roof. So there are six drains total. Here's the J drain. Here's it with the soil. This is Roof Light Soil, that National Green Roof Company. Oh, here are the, these are 5,000 pounds each. So two cubic yards. It's really heavy in, um, in the bags. And I love this picture. It's like little, little sedum soldiers about to be planted. Um, these are one inch sedum plugs from a nursery called Emery Knoll Farms got 10 minutes here. And uh, this is them in the ground. So this is in, this is June 2019. And I just think it, even though it looks pretty bare, it looks so so tidy and neat. And there's like so much potential for for these roofs. So this was uh, about 12 months later, in May of 2020, last summer, starting to fill in still a little patchy. And then this was this year, just last month. So the, those one inch sedum plugs are really, really growing. And Emory Knoll Farms um, hadn't done any green roof projects in Arkansas. They are a specific, they specifically grow green roof plants. Um, the guy that started that nursery is named Ed Snodgrass and uh, he grows just specific plants that grow on green roofs. So it's been cool to talk to them. They sent us um, a palette of plants that they thought would work based off of you know information I gave them about rainfall and heat and the location of these these green roofs and um, so we've been communicating with them about each of the species and how they're doing because you can see here some of them are doing great they're huge and then some are you know still doing okay but then put next to these other green roofs it makes them look kind of puny so we've been relaying that information to them which has been a cool cool relationship okay east ninth street this is the one with the buckets this was our first installation in 2018 and um, I walked the soil up through the house each bucket and it's a small green roof but it was a lot of soil <laughs> for one chick and so this was the um, this was the the order of operations for this residential green roof you can see we have a perforated pipe here kind of like you would in a French drain system that then um, had two drains there's one on this end and then another at the other end of the pipe that you can't really see in this picture we wrap that in the landscape fabric, put uh, drainage rock on either side, and then uh, put the J drain down and then put the soil in and then the plants. This is on the north side of the building. So um, we used only uh, shade loving plants with ajuga and ferns. 
And it turns out, even though this is on the north side of the building, it gets a lot of sun. So we've had to do some change up over the years. Uh, you can see it's in part sun here. So Hukra, it's really liked Hukra and there are still some ferns up there, but most of the Ajuga has gone. So that was 2018 and 19 and here's 2020. You can see we've replaced like there's balloon flower, dianthus, sedums, Hukra, things that can take more, more sun. And this was last month. So you can see we have some Autumn Joy sedums and then some sedum angelina and hookera in the shade. Again, it's, it's tricky with that, that sunshade condition. First National Bank, these are our two commercial projects we did last year. So here in green is where the green roof is. It's over the, the drive through where you put your money in the tube and right now, or you get your money from the tube. The, the drive through. This is an edge condition detail we did for um, for core architects for the first national bank. So you can see we use the metal edging, some drainage rock, the um, drainage fabric, I mean, sorry, the, the J drain with the drainage fabric, and then um, the growing medium and then plants and an irrigation system. This is the structure before it was installed. There are the drains, the edge condition. And here's us lifting the soil onto the roof. Here are the guys about to work really hard to get the soil from the bags and spread it across the roof. It's a picture from inside. Here's the, we, we were working sequentially across the roof to put the drainage layer down and then put the soil on top. There's a bucket covering the, the drains because we didn't, we hadn't built the rock condition yet. Um, and here's once the, the plants have been delivered, Here's irrigation. And one by one, we put in the sedums. So here's it in two, this was, this was just last year in 2020. In September of 2020, we finished the, the installation. And here was a couple months later in November, this is the client that wanted red. So we're really trying to pump red plants in there. Here's some red zinnias. You know, we had a really hard winter and I was concerned about this green roof with no heat from below to keep anything warm. I just, when it was freezing out, I was picturing like a solid green roof ice block <laughs> on this roof. Um, and you know, that might've been the case, but the, the plants did, they did pretty well. So this was just a couple days ago up on the roof. You can see there are red species of wildflowers here and the client is happy. And so as the sedums fill in, the wildflowers help to give, there's, there's something happening there, not just um, dirt and sedums growing. The Public Library expansion. Thank you, Public Library, for hosting us today. And this is the last project I'm going to show you guys. It's not a, not a residential project, but since you are our host, I'm going to show you. Maybe you saw this process happening, Renee. Here was our plan for installation. We did phase A, B, C, and then we came and did this yellow phase last after the elevator shaft was built. This whole space is now a green roof. And a side note about this green roof, um, there's a tree in the background here, and there used to be trees all across this area that were in a tree preservation easement. And I think that it is cool that now, even though the trees are gone, like I said, trees are trees are the best for ecosystem services, that there is something there still providing um, providing environmental benefits. So it's a it comes full circle and I think that's a beautiful narrative. Um, so I'm going to quickly go through some of the uh, installation pictures and I say I point out that it was July and it was freaking hot up there. Talk about needing to like drink electrolytes and, and stay healthy. It was very hot and it was in the middle of the pandemic. So it's kind of a kind of a crazy time. So here is the J drain. This is all drainage mat. Here's us rolling it out. And this is Poncho. He was so great to work with. And he helped us get the those big totes off the delivery truck and onto the ground here, you can see. And then we used a crane to lift the soil onto the roof. And ah, oh, it's, it looks like it was so simple, but it, it took, took a while to get all that soil um, spread out. And then here's the drip irrigation system. And this is so nice to me. It looks so clean and like a, a blank palette for installing, uh, installing plants. 
So the plants were delivered. These are from Emory Knoll Farms. If you, if you squint, you can see that they say green roof plants on the boxes. So they were shipped from Maryland. And um, these are the one inch plugs. So this is a mid-Atlantic mix. Um, it's really cute, red, blue, different colors of green. This is a leafy green mix, little broader leafed sedums. I would love to start using native, um, native sedums, more native plants. I have a project right now that uh, is requiring that we use all native plants. And I'm so glad about that because it's gonna force, force me to get that plant palette together. But um, here are all of the sedums, the one inch plugs, and then dispersed across the roof. And then the planting part, this, this took a while. Um, I think there were 30,000 sedum plugs, if I'm remembering correctly. It's a lot of, a lot of one inch plugs to plant. And there's partially done and so many sedum plugs. And up here, you can see we planted some Carl Forrester grasses and that's in an attempt to hide some of the, the HVAC system that's um, just to the right of the screen. And here's it starting to grow in, that like awkward teenage phase, a little, little bit of growth with the, um, the sedums are, you know, doing okay. And then the wildflowers are starting to, starting to sprout. And here's a couple months later. This is actually a sedum that, um, a, seed, a blooming sedum. I don't know the name of it. It's the top of my head. Uh, speaking of um, increasing biodiversity and creating habitat. Here's a, a butterfly on a zinnia. And here was towards the end of the summer, early fall. There's a detail, a drainage detail. And then this was just before it started to get cold in, in October, September, October. And then here, it, here's during the snow, that snow we had in April, um, you can see that just in a matter of like, what is that, eight months, that the sedum, those one inch sedum plugs have really flushed out. Um, and, and now they're even bigger. I don't have a picture from, from June, but you can see there's Siberian wallflower here amongst the Carl Forrester grasses. And that's all. Thank you for listening to me talk about green roofs. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Lee. Mm -hmm. Yes, I was very excited to watch the green roof um, in process, and it, it's lovely. The, the attractive feature here that people like to see um, connecting the original building to the expansion. So I'm glad. Sure. Thank you for showing pictures of that. Mm -hmm. That was a nice surprise. There are a couple of questions. Um, Cameron asks, what's the typical lifespan of a green roof? And do you have information on our values of intensive and extensive green roof? Partly serious, partly joking. Does anyone just let the local weeds populate themselves on the green roof? And would this reduce maintenance? Are there any cons to that? Yeah, good questions. I mean, these, these are things that I think about all the time. Uh, yeah, maintenance and um, the practicality of green roofs. And so, um, to answer your first question, what's the typical lifespan of a green roof? It's just as long as there's as long as there's soil and as long as the plants are alive, that you're gonna you're gonna still have a green roof. So, I do like to say that they they say that green roofs help to extend the lifetime of your waterproofing membrane because your whether you have asphalt shingles or waterproofing membrane exposed to the environment, it's seeing UV, it's in storms, it's in wind, they're critters. And um, with a green roof on top of that, you don't have those environmental exposures to your waterproofing membrane. So green roofs help to expand the lifespan of a waterproofing membrane. And then as far as the lifespan of a green roof, it's just as, as long as you want it there. Yeah. Um, okay, our values, there is information out there and I can't tell you how many times I've saved it uh, in my files, but I don't know those numbers off the top of my head. Um, if you put your email in here, I can send you some PDFs. Uh, and then let's see, local weeds populating themselves on the green roof, reducing maintenance. 
Totally. Uh, I think as long as those weeds aren't invasive, that would be fine. I mean, what's that phrase? Um, weeds are just a plant in the wrong place. So what's a weed really? It's like, it, you know, a dandelion, I think we can say is, you know, typically thought of as a weed, but they haven't always been thought of as weeds. And in some places people grow dandelions for beauty. So I, you know, if I had a client that was on board with putting weeds on their roof, that would be fine with me. Um, I think that, you know, one way to finesse the, the difference between weeds and then a super manicured situation on a green roof is to use native plants. Uh, they'll, they'll do that um, reducing maintenance. They'll fill that slot. That's a, a great segue into the next question uh -huh. about uh, weeding. Do green roofs need to be weeded? Yeah, so typically, um, or not typically, but I, I just, I have seen sometimes people talk about that green roofs don't require any maintenance. Um, I would say that green roofs are low maintenance, but they do still take maintenance and that maintenance is weeding. So, um, you know, if I were to install a green roof on my house, um, the maintenance I would do is to check the irrigation system, make sure it's working. I do that when I turn the irrigation system on in the spring or summer. And then when I go to um, winterize it in the fall or winter when it starts to freeze, because you don't want your irrigation system to, to blow. Um, so there's, there's the irrigation system maintenance if you have an irrigation system. Um, and then beyond that, just weeding is the main thing, pulling, pulling plants, the unwanted plants. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Uh, is there um, a location in the United States where a green roof wouldn't be successful, where, where it doesn't make sense or would be advisable? Is there places where you wouldn't want to have one? Yeah, so when I first started learning about green roofs, you know, I would hear people say things like, oh, I can't, we can't have a green roof here, it gets too hot. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's true. But that's wrong, because you can, anywhere that there are plants, you can have a green roof. I mean, it, in the desert, yeah, there's not as big of a plant palette, but you can still have, you can still have native yuccas or cactus on, on your green roof. So if, if plants grow there, you can have a green roof, um, but you know, just depends on whether you whether you want a green roof on on your site. So, if plants aren't growing somewhere in the U.S. to answer your question specifically, then yeah, you can't have a green roof there. But if plants are growing, you could you could do one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question: um, Take it you don't have to worry too much about hail damage if you have a green roof. Yeah, exactly. Um, actually, in last month's article of, or um, last month's publication of the Green Roofs for Healthy Cities magazine, there was an article about hail damage and, um, you know, how green roofs just help to protect your roof from, from hail damage. But of course, you know, then the plants are getting beaten up with hail, but it's just, they're a little bit hardier. It's, it's just like the plants in your landscape they'll they'll take as much damage as the plants in your yard. Okay, thank you. Cool. Hey, Lee, would, any yeah. other questions that uh, anybody has before we wrap up for the day? I see it's no. five two, and I think it's about start cooking dinner time. I know if we're all hungry. Well, yeah. you see, uh, Lee's email address here and Eric and Jane both share their contact information. If you think of any other questions, um, they have offered that information to you so you can reach out to them um, and get some, get some answers from them. Thank you for sharing that, you guys. Um, I can't thank you enough for being here. I'm so glad we got to do this. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we wanted to do this last summer, but um, you know, thank you, COVID, but we're moving on and moving forward. And I'm glad we got to do this finally. And I appreciate you all being here. Um, all the presenters, Jane, Eric, and Lee, thank you so much. And thank you for all the participants that were here with us. Ask such great questions and 
offered good comments. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and much. sign off. And uh, this is being recorded. So if you want to look back and re rewatch anything, um, refresh your mind on anything, it'll be on the library's uh, YouTube channel probably, I don't know, within a week or so. And uh, if you need to share it with somebody who needs to see this, please do so. Uh, a lot of great information. Thanks, everyone, again. Thank you. All Bye. right. Have a good rest of your weekend. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, guys. Bye.